Ron Howard met today to talk about the future of space exploration. They testified before a first ever congressional committee at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. You'll hear from Buzz Aldrin, the second man to set foot on the moon, Apollo 7 crewman Walter Cunningham, and the leader of the 1993 Hubble Telescope repair crew, Story Musgrave. The hearing lasts about three hours. The hour of 8.30 having arrived, the Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice will come to order. Uh, good morning and welcome. We have a very exciting hearing before us today with some dedicated and thoughtful and generally extraordinary witnesses. Let me say on behalf of the entire subcommittee and all those assembled here, it's a real privilege to have such a spectacular group of witnesses appearing before us today. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for giving us your time. I want to thank everyone involved in making this hearing possible, especially the Smithsonian Institute of Air and Space Museum, NASA, and the special witnesses who sit before us this morning. I'm going to keep my opening uh, statement brief this morning in uh, deference to our distinguished panels. I do want to say a little bit about why are we having this hearing, why we are having it here in the Space Museum, and why the topics of space and exploration and NASA oversight is a matter of American importance. This National Security Subcommittee is part of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. As such, we share oversight responsibility over a number of national security issues and also over NASA. Let me say that the Science Committee in the U.S. House, under the chairmanship of Congressman Sensenbrenner and the hard work of Space Subcommittee chaired uh, by Congressman Rohrbacher, have been and continue to be exceptional leaders in the oversight of NASA. Their work is critical in defining NASA's mission, keeping costs down, and keeping NASA on track, and matter of fact, uh, just passing out the authorization on NASA recently. We are trying to move forward through a series of hearings on NASA's vision and America's vision for the future. I believe we may be holding joint hearings on some of these topics, possibly with the uh, Committee on Science. And let me talk about a vision for a moment. In a time of tight budgets, American Congress and NASA must be ever conscious of the costs and the benefits of investments made. But we also must struggle. Uh, to truly understand that there are benefits, short-term and long-term, direct and indirect, that come from affordable space science, human space exploration, space-related technologies, aeronautical engineering breakthroughs, and really the basic education and the inspiration of our kids. These issues, so often forgotten in the public dialogue, are a part of what has made this nation great in the 1960s and 1970s. I can remember as a kid growing up uh, in the 50s, I date myself, uh, I, can, I think of the classic, the 1957 Chevrolet. Everybody remembers that. But as that car came out, I also thought, I remember a lot of times standing out in the dark in the cornfields of Illinois, so to speak, watching Sputnik go over. And the inspiration and the push that that gave us as a country to excel, to move forward, to plan, and to achieve. And that's something that we can't forget, or we should not forget, and should, we should not let go of. Uh, I think there certainly the chorus of concern surrounding the Cold War was part of that. And as a nation, we didn't flinch uh, in the face of that mounting threat. We met the challenge, and we got the job done. We set our eyes on the moon and getting their Americans there safely and returning them back to Earth. And we recognize the importance of mastering space both to our national security and to our long-term future. And let me say that the Air and Space Museum has created a spellbinding display here uh, to our left, which I understand uh, this area will open shortly, the display which chronicles the U.S.-Soviet competition to get to the moon and to master space also tells another story with long-term implications. It reveals the extraordinary level of cooperation that has characterized U.S.-Russian relations over the past decade and the great hope for international cooperation in space 
that may lie ahead. And the ahead part of this is what I really want to focus on. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, as this nation rushed to secure our future in the face of a looming national security threat, we also inspired the world. Not least, we inspired our young people. Young Americans swarmed to the study of math and science and engineering. <clears throat> I think the impact on our youth is important. I wasn't always in Congress. Uh, for many years, I, for 16 years, matter of fact, almost two decades, I coached and I taught. And during that period of time, I see what American youth can do if we challenge them. Uh, during the six years I spent in the Illinois legislature, I helped create a math and science academy because I thought we had to challenge our very best children, our very best kids, and bring them in with our very best teachers so that they could excel. And we hope that someday those graduates of that math and science academy be maybe taking some of your places. Although those are big shoes to fill, we have to create those types of people to be able to fill those shoes. Uh, in reference, just let me say that the personal computers that we all tap on every day, the microwave ovens, the plastics that preserve our food, the printed circuits, hundreds of medical advances, image technologies from MRI to the CAT scan, and thousands of smaller technological advances, including aeronautical design, and advances that make commercial aviation safer and safer, all can be directed directly to the space program. <clears throat> Let me say that I personally have a commitment to the study of math and science and to the study of space. I hope that uh, we can produce those gifted kids and those kids have a vision and have a dream that they can achieve some of the things and begin to achieve some of the things that you have worked for and dreamed for also. I uh, today would ask that uh, behind us the lunar module mock-up uh, that's in front of us today, uh, the one that uh, Mr. Aldrin and Neil Armstrong took to the moon, the command module mock-up, the same type that uh, Mr. Aldrin and uh, Walt flew is over to our left, the Hubble Space Telescope, which uh, Mr. Musgrave miraculously fixed on his historic spacewalk, uh, one of his six space shuttle is also over to our left. We are privileged to have these astronauts with us today uh, here on our first panel. We are also privileged to have us with us the director of a movie that truly captured the nation's imagination and all caused us to skip a few heartbeats from time to time. The film, which many of you will have seen, is Apollo 13, which poignantly retells the triumphant story of the explosion in outer space aboard our moon-bound Apollo 13 flight. A flight has carried astronauts, astronauts Jim Lovell, Jim Sw John Swigert, and Fred Heiss. The movie is a gripping tale about <clears throat> death at the doorstep and disaster at the doorstep of the Apollo program. In speaking with astronauts, they also say it's one of the most realistic pieces that have probably ever been produced for uh, our American public. Uh, they brought those men home sa safely, and that's what the story of Apollo 13 is all about. Uh, Ron Howard, we're pleased to have you here with us today also. Uh, this hearing is about the practical oversight of space development, but also about the need for vision, and as a nation in Washington, the Speaker of the House has spoken about this. And I look forward to hear today hearing our outstanding witnesses give their views on this crucial topic. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Souter if he has any uh, opening statement. Uh, Mr. Portman. No. Uh, also with us today, and uh, welcome, we're very pleased to have with us uh, <coughs> Dr. Weldon, uh, who represents the Kennedy Space Center. I know, Doctor, you have an uh, opening mm -hmm. statement. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for allowing me to appear with you today. And Chairman Hastert, I want to thank you for calling this hearing and applaud your efforts to give NASA greater visibility on Capitol Hill and with the public. I also want to thank our very distinguished panelists for taking time from their very busy schedules to be here today. 
I know each of you in many ways are probably busier than uh, congressmen, so it's especially a pleasure to have all of you here and take the time out uh, to make this statement in your support of our, our nation's space program. The Space Coast, uh, which makes up most of my Florida district, includes NASA's Kennedy Space Center, home to our nation's space shuttle fleet, and the launch site for all U.S. manned missions. It adjoins Cape Canaveral Air Station, which hosts most of our nation's commercial and military space launches, as well as adjoining Patrick Air Force Base, which is home to the U.S. Air Force's 45th Space Wing. So a love and interest for all things related to space runs through my congressional district, and I have been an outspoken proponent for NASA and our nation's space efforts. The people of the Space Coast, along with everyone else in our nation, sit captivated every time we have a launch from Florida. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people from across our country and around the world line Central Florida's highways and viewing areas to see the space shuttle lift off. The space program motivates our children and inspires scientists, engineers, and explorers who constantly probe the unknown secrets of our world and the universe. And despite some recent difficulties, NASA is still a symbol of our nation's preeminent position as a scientific leader in the world. NASA is making important investments in such programs as the International Space Station, the Next Generation Reusable Launch Vehicle, which will help the U.S. regain market shares of commercial launches, and NASA is leading the way in search of planets outside our solar system and other scientific endeavors that probe the boundaries of our scientific, medical, and engineering knowledge. As Vice Chairman of the Space Subcommittee, I am committed to assuring NASA has the resources it needs to move forward with its mission. We must continue to invest in the space station despite some recent difficulties, and we must continue to safely and efficiently fly the space shuttle fleet. And we must foster the development of reusable launch vehicles, which promise to dramatically lower the cost of getting into orbit. However, we must also balance our human spaceflight program with a robust and ambitious science and unmanned exploration program. I sat transfixed with the rest of the world in the summer of 1994 when Jupiter was bombarded by the Shoemaker-Levy comet, bringing the tiny dimensions of our world into the universal perspective. I anxiously await the data and pictures that our recent recently launched probe to Mars will bring, as well as the fascinating story that should emerge from our mission to Saturn later this year. So we need to have a balanced program. Automated probes and robots can serve us well in the initial phases of exploration and to explore where humans will never be able to go. But in order to truly get a sense of the alien world, we have to be there to touch it, to feel it. I support a return to the moon, maybe to stay this time, and a mission to Mars. Technically, we can do these things now, but we must find the political and economic will to make it happen. We, we must also foster our commercial space sector. I firmly believe the future of space exploration will depend in a large part on the private sector's role, and I want to give every business an opportunity to use space as an economic resource. We need to take a hard look at how the federal government interacts with our commercial space community and make sure we are not hindering their growth potential. Finally, I would like to make a point that is very often overlooked in our annual debate on the space program. I support the space program for a variety of reasons, among them the scientific and medical benefits as well as economic growth, international competitiveness, and a stepping stone to future human exploration of the solar system. However, I also strongly believe that our civilization's future lies in space. As you look through history, civilizations that cease to explore and expand their technological frontiers cease to exist. They may choose not to expand and explore for a variety of reasons, but the end result is the same. The civilization stagnates and becomes a part of history. 
our nation and, in fact, our world is at such a threshold. In space lies the future of the human race, and to turn away from that challenge now could set us back as much as a century or perhaps more. Of course, if we stopped exploring space tomorrow, we probably wouldn't feel the immediate impact. It would come to our children and to our grandchildren who would lose the drive to explore, and with that would be lost the historic opportunity of our nation. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for calling this hearing and allowing me to join you today. I hope this can begin a fruitful dialogue of the future of our nation's space program, and I look forward to the testimony of the panelists, and I, too, thank them for joining us today. Well, Dr. Weldon, we certainly uh, appreciate you being here today in your uh, opening statement. Let me add that Tom Barrett, our ranking member from Wisconsin, was very supportive of this hearing and <clears throat> was not able to make it for personal reasons and back in his district. If I may, I'd ask our first panel to stand to be sworn in, and before I formally introduce each of you in turn, Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you were about to give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Let the uh, record show that the witness responded in the affirmative. Please sit down. Now I'd like to formally welcome our first panel, of course, uh, Dr. Buzz Aldrin is a man who needs no introduction. All of you know that he piloted the lunar module on Apollo 11, the first manned mission to the moon, and then he was one of the first men to walk on the moon. You may also know that uh, Dr. Aldrin was already a war hero before he ever became an astronaut, having flown 66 combat missions in Korea. And uh, Dr. Aldrin is also a scholar who owned a, earned a Ph.D. from MIT for his scientific work on spaceflight. And uh, Mr. Walt Cunningham is a Marine fighter pilot before coming the, to the astronauts and flew the Apollo 7, which was well, the first manned Apollo mission. Uh, in 1968. Uh, since then, he has built a career as an extremely successful businessman, engineer, and civic leader, and we thank you for being with us today. And Mr. Ron Howard, of course, is the well-known actor and movie director who directed the award-winning uh, film Apollo 13, along with many other Hollywood uh, uh, blockbusters, which I'm sure that we've all seen. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Story Musgrave is the astronaut who accomplished the daring and successful repair in space of the Hubble telescope. He has flown numerous missions on the space shuttle and has earned academic honors for his work in aerospace, medicine, and physiology. And we thank you all for coming. And uh, Dr. Aldrin, please proceed uh, with you and be followed by Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Howard and Mr. Musgrave. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members of Congress, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to be called here today. As you know, I have more than a passing interest in space, and I appreciate the chance to say a few words about the possibilities that await this nation, especially if we make the right choices. I also want to thank the Air and Space Museum here, which has really outdone themselves by allowing this first ever hearing in this great hall. It's been nearly 30 years since Neil and I walked on the moon. Yet that day is as vivid to me as I know it is to many of you. It was historic, and it's meaning for all mankind since it was an achievement that Americans and all mankind shared in continues today. There were a few risks, of course, when we finally let set the lunar module down with Neil piloting and me calling out the numbers for him. On July 20th, 1969, we had only an estimated 16 seconds of fuel left in the descent stage. On the surface, if we had fallen and a suit ripped, there wasn't much chance of surviving that. If the one ascent engine didn't fire or the computers on board malfunctioned, we would never have left the moon. If the rendezvous with Mike Collins in the command module hadn't gone flawlessly, there were other rather unsavory consequences. But the mission was built on the know-how and knowledge of thousands of dedicated Americans. It was also built on faith and a national commitment. 
I was fortunate and proud to have been chosen for Apollo 11, and I'm here to give back what I can to a nation that gave me an unparalleled opportunity, the chance to land and walk on the moon, and to be the first mission ever to do so, and then to continue to carry a message of encouragement for an ever better future in space. My message today is also a call for action, a call to all Americans, especially young Americans, to reach out for the stars, reach for greater knowledge, have faith in the future, and help re-inspire a renewed national commitment to human space exploration. First, I want to talk a moment about space and about those three words, knowledge, faith, and commitment. Then briefly, I want to touch on five specific aspects of spaceflight that beckon us as a nation. My chief message is this, America must dream, <clears throat> have the faith to achieve the dream, and develop the fullest possible knowledge of the possibilities that await us. Even the best trained and the brightest engineers, scientists, business people, and political leaders, if they have no vision, are mere placeholders in time. We must dare again to take risks as a nation. And we must see again that this generation of Americans, those alive today, have at their fingertips the technology and the recent history necessary to trigger a cascade of vast new discoveries for this living generation and those that will follow. Some would say that we have an obligation to use the talents and insights we've been given. Those of us who can remember the power and majesty of the Apollo program's accomplishment. Let me say as I sit here before you today, having walked on the moon, that I am myself still awed by that miracle. And I can still remember the feeling of exhilaration as I look here at the lunar module behind me and recall backing down that ladder to the lunar surface. But that awe in me and in each of us for what this nation and people can bring forth when we try should be, must be, the engine of future achievement. Not a slow, dimming light from a time once bright. It's not the obligation, however, that I wish most to talk about. It's the vision, the faith, and brilliant opportunities that await us. Though these are what bring me here today. In a book that Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and I wrote in uh, 1970 called First on the Moon, Arthur Clarke offered a truly visionary epilogue. Clarke made a number of predictions. Some of those predictions, like the emergence of the space shuttle, reduced payload costs to space, and a satellite-driven communications network, as well as other breakthrough technologies, have come true. Others, including routine commercial flight to and from space, space tourism, settlements on the moon by the early 2000s, and human exploration of Mars in our lifetimes are yet to be realized. But each of these advances require three things, knowledge, faith, and commitment. Knowledge that we can achieve these feats for all mankind. Faith in ourselves, in things larger than ourselves, and in the importance to mankind that we use the opportunities at our fingertips. And a newfound national commitment 
to do what God has given us the power to do. In short, I'm here today to issue a call for national action. <clears throat> this is an incredible, <clears throat> uncontainable country, America. We have the power in our national consciousness to dream as few dare to dream, and the power in our national talent pool and convictions to make come true that which we dare to dream. I'm here to say, let the race begin. Let us reawaken America to the power of a compelling dream and the ability with determination to achieve that dream. And what is the dream of which I'm talking? It's the John F. Kennedy's dream to reach the moon and beyond. Written in giant letters, giant new steps and leaps. As Kennedy so powerfully said, we do not do these things because they are easy, but because they are hard. Yes, this is the dream of Arthur Clarke, but also of America's most forward-looking engineers, her proud and growing astronaut corps, and NASA's gifted leadership of men and women. Lighting our way is the legacy left by past greats, names like Werner von Braun, Jerry O'Neill, Thomas Paine, <clears throat> and Carl Sagan. It's the dream of those great and dedicated men and women who were part of Apollo. But it's also the dream of a thousand budding American entrepreneurs who are at this very moment laboring to make space flight safe, economical, and no less routine than transcontinental air flight. These are men and women of America's private sector. Expanding space flight was Robert Goddard's dream, and the dream of those who made possible Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the shuttle. And there is more. The inspiration I want, to, want us to willingly embrace today, again, is common to all Americans and all humanity. I know many of you feel it because I've spoken with you. I think those political leaders who feel this inspiration are in sync with America's heartland and with our future. America and her fascination with space is again alive, and we're on the verge of moving again, moving as a nation, moving the tectonic plates of historic achievement. I would beckon you to let yourselves dream again and you may yet hear what I hear ricocheting about the American public. Excitement and a willingness to take risks again. Behind that excitement and willingness, a slow growing call <coughs> for renewed action. Last month, Americans were thrilled to the appearance of the comet Hale-Bopp. They were riveted by a reliving of Apollo 13's mission. And let me say here, uh, Ron Howard did a magnificent job in producing that movie, keeping it faithful to the facts. And Americans were even thrilled by memories brought to the surface by when the Star Wars trilogy was re-released earlier this year. Last month, we also learned that one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, also appears to have an ocean greater in volume than our own and a hot center and the implications of that discovery are far from small. Yet most Americans don't yet know the best of it. We have within our grasp the technology to get everyday citizens into space routinely and safely for the thrill of a once-in-a-lifetime ride and adventure. We also have the technology to cost-effectively return to the moon again. We're even at the threshold of being able to affordably get to Mars with manned missions 
and I'm helping NASA in Houston to chart an evolutionary strategy for Mars with very promising long-range sustainability. Let me say this, every American whose heart beats faster at the news of possible water on the moon or possible life on Mars, or when they hear of an affordable lottery ticket into space for the fun of it, or the chance to safely visit orbiting space resorts, a trip that will soon be no less safe than driving cross country to see the nation's, nation's marvelous air and space museum. These Americans know what I'm talking about. So I say, let us join together as a nation, undivided and reawaken these wonderful and achievable dreams. Let us dare to think about the future. Let's talk again about a permanent presence on the moon and sustained interplanetary travel with all its discoveries. Let's draw up the plans and let's begin the investment. These events are achievable and perhaps if you look closely at the largely unknown advances we've made since Apollo 11, even within our lifetime. Let's think again as we did in the 1960s as a great and ambitious nation, remembering cost efficiencies, but having faith and a renewed commitment to explore and experience space and its richness. Today we have the knowledge and technology to tap unlimited energy potential in near-Earth space and unimaginable resource potential beyond. Indeed, last, week's, last week was historic for Congress's balanced budget success. And I congratulate Congress for the vision that it took to achieve that success. But imagine having space-based solar energy assets and space-based resources that truly keep this planet pollution-free and make budget deficits literally unthinkable by their sheer richness. That's what awaits us if we make the right investments. The future I allude to has yet to be built, but all this is not fiction. It's very close to being fact. A clean, green, non-polluted Earth drawing on abundant space-tapped energy from our sun. Passenger travel to and from space for commercial and adventure activity, the step-by-step -step advance to Mars, even low-cost cycling missions to and from that planet, and then beyond. All these goals are worth pursuing and well within our grasp. What's more, they will re-energize this nation. And if Apollo is any example, spur rippling economic growth. You know the Apollo program's miraculous achievements were built on a dream by this nation's leaders and our people. Let us take stock of ourselves and our place in history of mankind and let us not be timid or content to rest on our laurels. Already a generation has passed since we walked on the moon. I will say it again and pray as I did when we sat on the moon that we can start this engine. Greatness requires knowledge, faith, and commitment. The investment and in public determination to reawaken the dream will start here with Congress and today's leaders. Before closing, I want to touch on several specifics, and on questioning, I'll gladly go into more detail. First, refinding the inspiration that we had in Apollo 
and that the entire nation had, reawakening the dream is vital for America's children, for your children and my children. I need only note that America's children flocked to math and science in the era of Apollo, both during and after those historic missions. Since then, there's been a clear erosion of our inspiration and fascination, the curiosity and the calling of science, and especially the countless sciences tied to space and space flight. We can and must re-inspire our children. We live through historic achievements based on well-trained minds. They should have that experience and their generation should have the reservoir of that training for their sake and the nation's. Second, I think we have to get serious about investing in the best next generation reusable space transportation options. There are several options, and they're all worth study and investment. One I'll briefly allude to, however, is the so-called Star Booster, two-stage orbit. The common sense of this approach and the economical nature of the investment cannot be oversold, and I'll gladly get into more of this on questioning or afterward. Third, I cannot stress the nearness and excitement that surrounds giving every American a real shot at getting into space safely and for the pleasure of that experience. I call it the drive for space tourism because that's what it is. The investments are already being made and we need chiefly to support them with complementary efforts at NASA and a general reduction in outdated regulations restricting private sector rocketry and space exploration. Fourth, we must again look seriously at and invest in technologies which support both at NASA and in the private sector manned missions and a permanent presence on the moon. There are endless spin-off and commercial development arguments for this investment. But the one argument that I feel is most compelling is the mission is larger than ourselves. We were called together as a nation and as a species by the Apollo missions to the moon then there is simply no measure of the good that these explorations brought to us all, not least by bringing the global community closer together. Fifth and finally, the importance of now seriously looking at and investing in manned missions to Mars, leading toward permanent sustainability there, could not be greater. The time is upon us to move into the investment phase and to look at making practical the technologies that we now have but could only have dreamed of in the 1970s. We can do this and we must free the private sector from regulations that hamper the sort of experimentation that will make this a reality, even as we support NASA's research and development. We must reach out and do what we're able to do, and we can do this within our lifetimes. In closing, let me say that space is our final frontier, <clears throat> and that frontiers are essential for the advance of humanity and for advance of individuals within the community of man. Our children will thrill to the achievements we set forth to achieve. And we can achieve them if we're willing to dream, to embrace the knowledge, faith, and commitment, and to relight that engine 
which will take us all first into space, then to the moon and Mars, and finally to the stars. As I like to say with my feet firmly on the ground on Earth today, as surely as they were on the moon nearly 30 years ago, let's join together and shoot for the stars. Ad Astra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Aldrin. At this time, uh, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. You do me honor by inviting me to share my thoughts with you here this morning. And it's a pleasure to be here with my associates. Buzz and I st entered the space program the same day. Story Musgrave, who bridges the period between the golden age manned space flight, Apollo, and the current shuttle era. And as we sit here amongst the artifacts of the golden age of manned space flight, I would like to talk a little bit about a movement which has been away from the chance of dangerous adventure and towards a risk-free society. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy announced to the world, we will land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth in this decade. We choose to do this, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. What a truly audacious statement. At that time, not a single American had yet been into orbit. It took vision, initiative, leadership. It took someone willing to stick their neck out, someone willing to risk failing. Economic problems and social progress were serious issues in 1961, too, much as they are today. So was the budget. President Kennedy knew that even in hard times, you cannot take your eyes off of the future. While responding to the needs of today, we must also invest in tomorrow. Today, man's landing on the moon is history. Against enormous odds, with the whole world watching, a group of engineers, scientists, and managers accepted the challenge, took a risk, and changed the way that we perceived our world. And not, not incidentally, they kept the spirit of adventure alive for one more generation. We went after moon rocks, but the real payoff was probably a surprise to all of us. The real payoff was what happened to us back here on Earth. Apollo changed all of us inside. For a brief period during the time of Apollo, our society felt good about itself again. We felt together. The moon landings proudly proclaimed to others that we accepted no limits on what we could accomplish. Yes, we knew it was risky, but there was never any doubt that the potential gain greatly exceeded the risk. And success carried with it the promise that our children and our grandchildren would be exploring the frontiers of the universe. After Apollo 11 in 1969, <clears throat> Australian Prime Minister Jack Gordon put it very nicely, I thought, in his message which said, among other things, he, he ended up by saying, may the high courage and technical genius which made this achievement possible be so used in the future that mankind will live in a universe in which peace, self-expression, and the chance of dangerous adventure are available to all. What a wonderful dream. In the past 28 years, what has happened to that chance of dangerous adventure? Today, the once rambunctious American spirit of innovation and adventure is being paralyzed by the desire for a risk-free society. Security and a risk-free existence have replaced opportunity and the chance of dangerous adventure as the goal of most Americans. What has happened to the sense of dedication, commitment, the stick to itiveness the spirit of adventure that made us great? 
Are we doomed to a future where our resources will be used only to feed our existence and never for dreaming and reaching? This country was established by risk takers. Without risk takers, there would be no United States Constitution today. The 56 men who signed that amazing document knew they were risking death when they pledged their fortunes, their lives, and their sacred honor to achieve independence. And this country was built by those who met a challenge and accepted the risk, not cautious naysayers, built by those who wanted to live, not simply exist. It's the Christopher Columbuses and the Neil Armstrongs who move us forward, not the Ralph Naders. With a Ralph Nader at the head of a wagon train, we would never have made it across the plains and over the Rockies. Today, we hear incessant talk of limits, usually expressed as a shortage of funds. Any grand aspirations we might have are at the mercy of political institutions, some of the most risk-averse groups in our society. Our only real limits are those we place on ourselves. In a country which has survived many crises, none has been more important than the current crisis of will. Today, we fail not because of our inability to do something. We fail because of our unwillingness to tackle it in the first place. We are simply unwilling to take the risk. The Apollo program was a catalyst to education for a whole generation of students. The inspiration of another grand objective is, is as important to this generation as the successful implementation of Apollo was to America in the 1960s. But we have ducked such a commitment. And education has been on a downhill slide for years. We do a further disservice to today's students, our next generation of leaders. The relationship between challenge, risk, responsibility, and leadership is also being neglected. Leadership requires confidence in oneself before you can instill confidence in others. And how can you have self-confidence if you have avoided risk all your life? I believe every generation has an obligation to take some risks, to raise society to some higher plateau, to free men's minds for a look at new worlds. The society which does not utilize its knowledge and capabilities to push back boundaries begins to decline and is replaced by those soci societies which do utilize their capabilities. A good example, at the height of its glory, the Chinese fleet sailed for India 60 years prior to Columbus' search for India. The emperor called the fleet back and burned it. China to this day has not returned to a position of significant world power. America is at a crossroads. Are we to maintain our technological leadership and invest in our future, or will we mire ourselves solely in the problems of today and squander that future? The choice is ours. Let us acknowledge that the chance of dangerous adventure is a basic need of the human spirit and commit this country to a new grand challenge. In the next century, no one will care how carefully and cautiously we survived the last third of the 20th century. But they will celebrate our willingness to accept risk, to make a commitment, to expand our universe, and to change forever the way we looked at our world when we decided to land a man on the moon. You and I cannot set foot on distant planets, but we can set our minds on the future, and perhaps return to a society where peace, self-expression, and the chance of dangerous adventure are available to all. I have taken the liberty of outlining a space policy which I believe meets those needs. The full text is available to you, gentlemen. Uh, but I summarize here just the principal points before I complete. America has lost the vision of its role in space. We have forgotten why we go into space and what benefits we derive from space exploration. 
For the past 35 years, the space program has been a primary change engine for American technical advance. These advances have fed the private sector in their search for commercial applications and thereby added to our economic strength. What is desperately needed now is a clearly defined, easily understood, and consistent policy for U.S. space activities. Point number one, preeminence in space as a national policy. Preeminence among the spacefaring nations of the world requires but one thing, that we decide to do it. This can only occur if it is a matter of national policy. Two, a long-range goal for NASA. A national space policy, policy should encompass NASA, the private sector, and to some degree the Department of Defense. It should promote not only the exploration of the heavens, but also the defense of America. NASA's long-range goal should be no less than the exploration of our solar system. This goal bypasses the problem of repeatedly having to sell new starts. It embraces both manned and unmanned activities. Number three, the space station is a good start. Its value, however, as an inspirational agent has been compromised by wavering commitment, dragged out funding, and turning it into a foreign policy program. Number four, space funding, excuse me, I, I didn't finish with point three. International partnerships should be based on substance, not appearance, and not politics, and we shouldn't have to subsidize our partners. Number four, space funding must be both adequate and predictable. Predictable federal funding is essential if the private sector is expected to make future commitments and long-range plans. NASA should stop overselling programs at their inception, and Congress should be realistic about accepting the true cost of achievement and leadership. Number five, space research and development is an investment. Space research and development funding is not in direct competition with entitlement programs. It is an investment which keeps America prosperous and is vital and enables us to support entitlement programs. Six, assured access to space through a balanced launch fleet. America should balance the access to space provided by the space shuttle with programs to develop expendable launch vehicles and a new heavy lift vehicle. Number seven, space and national defense. A national space program has a legitimate and vital role to play in the future defense of this nation, just as railroads, shipping, and aviation did once they came into being. The overall military space program, per se, should be treated not as space policy issue, but as a military defense issue. Eight, cooperative ventures. One characteristic of U.S. leadership in space has been its openness to international cooperation. In the future, such cooperation should be based on equitable contribution as well as equitable return. It should capitalize on the unique strengths of each partner with each partner carrying his own load, no loss leaders. Nine, strong leadership and clear priorities are required. A personal commitment from the president, whomever that may be, is paramount, but it requires Congress for approval and funding. NASA, the private sector, and the Pentagon must be challenged to accomplish it. The program must be clearly communicated to the American people who must subscribe to it. Everything possible should be done to prevent space disasters, but we must be willing to persevere in spite of disasters and risks. Those are my nine points. I'll just finish by saying it is time for another leap forward for mankind. Commitment to any policy costs money. We are all aware of the current budget constraints. Congress, in meeting their obligation to the present, should not forget their obligation to the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. <clears throat> Mr. Howard. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And there's, a, uh, there's an old joke that many of you probably know, uh, which starts when a fellow arrives in Heartland America and announces, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. Not, not that funny of a joke, but you, you probably recognize it. Uh, I think it must be equally unsettling, though, here in Washington, when somebody arrives and says, Hi, I'm from Hollywood. I'm, I'm here to tell you what to do. Uh, 
So let me just start by saying that I really only come to offer my heartfelt opinions and a, f a few reflections. I'm not a, a policy maker, uh, certainly not an astronaut, and uh, frankly, I'm uh, uh, humbled by the people that I share uh, this panel with, uh, and also exhilarated, I, I need to add, by uh, the remarks and the wisdom uh, already uh, offered. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm not an expert. I, I just love this country, and, uh, and I appreciate this opportunity to be able to throw in my two cents about our future, since it depends directly on the decisions that we make today and in the very near future. First, uh, space has always fascinated me, and I will forever be awed by the unparalleled inspiration that went into the Apollo program, and for the record, also uh, into the Mercury and Gemini programs. That inspiration moved me as a boy, and it still moves me today as a man. I grew up in an America that was ambitious, courageous, unafraid of the unknown, ready to take risks in the name of curiosity, discovery, knowledge, human progress, the thrill of victory, and the preservation of the nation's security. Two of the men who made that happen, Messrs. Aldrin and Cunningham, are here beside me today. They sat atop the Saturn V, mightiest rocket ever created, and were launched into space on a pillar of fire, more than seven million pounds of thrust. That took courage and conviction, years of training and hard work. It also took believing, a believing, dedicated, unafraid nation. As many of you would imagine, I admire that achievement as much now as I did then. And this is part of the reason that I directed Apollo 13, the movie, before I get into a few forward-looking thoughts, l let me just uh, pause and tell you why that movie, Apollo 13, was produced by my partner Brian Grazer and myself. That movie, featuring the heroism of three astronauts, tireless and ingenious NASA personnel on the ground, and thousands of determined Americans, represents the best that America as a nation can bring forth the seeming impossibility of landing a man safely on the moon and, and returning him to Earth was fresh in the American mind when Apollo 13 was launched. Apollo 11 and man's first steps on another celestial body, the moon, had occurred just nine months earlier in July 1969. Little did Amer America know that Apollo 13 and the unforeseen explosion that rocked that little island in space would call upon this great nation to add impossibility to impossibility and bring human lives safely back against insurmountable odds. Every readout said that it couldn't be done, particularly in those first few hours. Every gauge spelled disaster, except the gauge of our national character. And in that single, and in that, in that single gauge, America, those who knew and worked, those who supported Apollo, and just prayed, found out who they were, found out who we as a nation are. We are a nation that does not give up, not on a dream, not on a single human being. And in that incredible conviction, so poignantly aired by Gene Kranz's prediction that this would be our finest hour, we again took stock of who we were as a people. Well, that was nearly 30 years ago now. And the reason I'm sitting here today before you is that I think another crisis of sorts is upon us. Uh, call it a slow motion Apollo 13. In uh, 1997, we must again take stock of who we are as Americans. Apollo 11's plaque left by Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong on that same moon that you see up there every night says, we, this nation, reached out and touched that place for all mankind. All mankind means every nation, and it means the generations to come. My kids, your kids, their kids, and that's the real point. Today, we must see that space exploration, space development, space science, space medicine, and our future, both here on Earth and out there, 
depends on the courage of our current convictions. And just as Apollo 7, 11, and 13 defined us as a nation, so do the decisions before Congress and this nation today. Apollo was a magnet that in the 1960s and 70s pulled our best and brightest kids into the study of math, the rainbow of sciences and engineering. Industry and educators, parents and policymakers were all exhilarated by the long-term goals that were set. Beginning with President Kennedy's pledge to reach the moon in a decade, and the benefits of that exhilaration are well beyond counting. The steep climb in education is why we all enjoy microwave ovens, personal computers, and innumerable new medicines, electronic, avionic, and basic mechanical advances. Our national security was preserved. Our commercial base and job opportunities widely expanded. Technologies, technologies which <clears throat> protect the environment and make for cleaner energy leaped ahead, and the sheer ripple effect propelled us forward. The real impact runs even deeper. Exploring space and the unknown is a human quest and an American dream. Without dreams, we wither. The thrill of achievement is only a memory that you and I have as a generation which lived through Apollo because we were well served by leaders who had the long term in mind. Now, we are the leaders in a manner of speaking. Given the, the progress that we've made in space exploration since the Apollo era, historians, I believe, will hold that it was not simply curiosity, a pioneering spirit, or a quest for scientific gain that carried us from the Earth to the moon. But instead, in a political conflict, our country, motivated by patriotism and a dose of national fear, came from behind and prevailed in a space race. <clears throat> it's a great triumph, to be sure, but hardly the primary spirit we would like to assign that great leap forward. Somehow, without the political threat hanging over our heads, our national appetite for exploration has been curbed, and that is a shame, because I believe that the leaders who had the vision and the foresight to fuel our early space programs had it right. The future still belongs to those who will dare to succeed and continue succeeding in space. I'm of the mind that curiosity is not merely a human quality, but is, in fact, an instinct which drives us. Human exploration of space has begun. People are going to explore the galaxies and make untold discoveries and gains in the process. And as a patriot, I hope our legacy will be that the United States of America took the lead in space and never looked back that we grew and learned and excelled, not out of fear, but for the betterment of humankind. Now that legacy is ours. We've earned it. These astronauts and thousands of others working with them have dedicated their lives to putting us into that position. The legacy will be ours if we are willing to reach for it to quietly take the position that given our stature at the moment, we can always reassert ourselves in the area of space exploration, you know, if and when it becomes politically more pressing or necessary. Well, that is an assumption, perhaps bordering on arrogance, that I hope we don't indulge in. Wouldn't it be tragic if our program somehow became an odd, ironic footnote when the story of mankind's movement into space is written when we could have been the pivotal players. Now, <clears throat> you all are members of Congress and hold the, nation, the nation's future, our future in space, and the opportunity for progress and greatness in this realm in your hands. I come from an industry that dreams for a living. Together we must, for our kids and our nation's long-term future, think big. 
We have to embrace renewed discussion of a mission to Mars and a permanent human settlement on the moon. We have to tell the nation about the incredible discoveries that have already come out of the 83 shuttle missions. This year alone, we'll get four new inoculations from a 1988 shuttle experiment and we'll save more than a billion dollars uh, in medical costs alone from a, a revolutionary breast cancer detection technology made possible by the shuttle program's imaging research. There are, are hundreds of stories like that one, and they call on us not to give up, indeed, to dig down, read that gauge again, that gauge of our national character. Apollo 13 is, is just a movie, uh, and of, of course, lest we forget, uh, it's a movie of, of an extraordinary real-life mission. And that was just one mission. But the messages that James Lovell, Jack Swaggart, and Fred Hayes sent to us should reverberate down through the ages. And it's been almost an age since they sent it. The message is this. When you next look up into the night sky, don't just see the past and sigh about the risk and the grandeur of what we did up there. Instead, look again and see the future. See the importance of investing in, thinking and talking about, living and learning from the great place that we call space. My hope is that this hearing is the start of something really big, the start of an American reawakening about the magnificence and calling of space. My hope is that, <clears throat> my hope is that here in Washington, <clears throat> excuse me, and out there in homes of those who see or learn about this hearing, that there will be a new resolve to see in the night sky the faces of our children, the silent call of those who would have the benefit of prideful memories and discoveries from space just as, as we had. What I hope these thoughts trigger, if nothing more, is a serious rethinking about the terrible and wonderful significance of space. For all mankind, we as Americans have a destiny. It is a wonderful destiny, one that I know many of you believe in, one that the men on either side of me, <laughs> excuse me, reading the text, on my right, <laughs> have risked all for, one that I tried to capture in Apollo 13, the movie, and now I hope that we may be able to reach together to reawaken America and to fulfill. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. Hard. At this time, uh, Dr. Musgrave. Thank you very much, Chairman, for in inviting me to this, uh, this grand hearing in a, uh, a really grand setting. I've had the privilege, and it's an incredible privilege, of having been an astronaut for 30 years. Space is my calling. It's what I am. It's what I do. As most of you know, I'm an incredible romantic and an idealist, and so uh, I have some ideas which may be a little divergent from, from others. Uh, I am considered, I see Walt smiling at me, I'm considered to be uh, organizationally and politically naive, and uh, maybe that's to an advantage in a place like this. <coughs> but. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, living the things that space are, exploration, discovery, brand new kinds of science that increase uh, the knowledge of our universe and of ourselves, to see and to develop some of the grandest technologies, to look down upon Earth, to communicate the vision of our home from out there to help to and instill a spirit of stewardship of our home and space of Earth to help to stimulate ecological issues to learn all the time to be uh, exposed to the heat of the kitchen where performance is the bottom line day after day both on a personal basis but also as an example of lifelong learning and education, 
uh, to go out and talk to people, to talk to kids, to show them uh, what education is all about, show them what it can do, to show them how what we do in space is an entry point for their learning uh, principles in the classroom. I've had the extraordinary privilege of uh, representing uh, you all in space. There's millions of people that could have done this. Every time uh, the door opened, I did put my foot in it, and I lived this thing to the greatest extent, and I gave all I could to this. But it's an incredible privilege to help humanity see what this incredible cosmos, this universe, this Earth, the planets, the stars, and everything else is all about. Spaceflight is such a neat thing because it bridges all kinds of, of disciplines. The kind of things that, uh, that that telescope is showing us and all the other grand observatories and uh, the satellites that look at planets and the Earth, they're not maybe quite powerful enough to yet but uh, if you look at Hubble images and others, we're tending to, to bridge that gap now between astronomy and philosophy, uh, between cosmology and theology. Those are incredibly important things because they touch even at the elementary school level. They help to show us our universe. They help to show us as humans what our place is in the universe. They help to show us, which is extraordinarily important, uh, what it means to be human. Thanks uh, in part to what we do in space, uh, we are becoming global creatures, not just people of a certain town, a certain state, a certain nation. I think it has helped to globalize the culture and humanity. As we push on into space, we'll become solar system creatures and eventually universal creatures we will think about, we will have a feel, we have a geometric sense of where we are in the universe, and I think that will better our value system if we think of ourselves as a universal culture. I think the space program in the long-term distance will help to guide us as a, as a species, a species ethic. I have a wish list, as naive as it may be, for what we ought to do five things uh, in the future of space, five actions which if you were to give me a wish list, what would I like to see happen? Number one is low cost access to space. We've been in a space uh, for about 40 years now and we have made no headway at all in terms of reducing the cost of spaceflight. I've got to put that as the number one priority. All of the fantastic potential and the dreams uh, which Buzz so eloquently set forth, they can only happen if we reduce the cost. We can't launch a bunch of telescopes and we can't get into privatization, commercialization, studies of the Earth cost of spaceflight is the basic common denominator which is going to allow everything else to happen. It'll allow space in ways to pay for itself. It will make all those things which Buzz set forth as potentials for future spaceflight. They can only happen if you reduce the cost of spaceflight. I've never worked in Washington. I've never you know, been at a level, I have been in the trenches for 30 years. And so I'm not sure how to implement this. <clears throat> but if, if I was where you were, I would establish the mandate for lowering the cost of space flight as the number one priority of space. At some level, I would force NASA and DOD the contractors, the industry, and the commercial and private sectors that want to use space and who are driven by the market to get together and I would give them a mandate and there's only one bottom line and that is lower the cost of spaceflight. I would not specify to them that it has to be a single stage or a two stage or a multi stage. I would leave the best thinkers in the business to come up with the right solution 
the most simple and elegant technology to get that job done. Most of the conversation we've been talking about here today is from the 60s, what you call the golden era of space. There's a reason for that is that we had an extraordinarily hard line task to do, and that is go to the moon. Going to the moon defined the way we did business. We had to get there in eight years, and we were told to do that, and we went and we did that. In eight years, we launched four programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and we were well on the way to a hugely successful space station program, and we did that within a decade because we had a mandate to go do it, and we only had one line. We had one statement at the bottom line, to the moon and back in this decade. That harnessed our energies, it focused our efforts, that bottom line built the entire structure. It built our organization and the way we did business. I think if we had a single hard line and you made us go do it in the near term, NASA does have some very, very high-tech ideas on te technological development, very futuristic ideas, but the technological challenge is absolutely immense. It is very, very speculative, and we may get into a very, very long-term technological development process, and we may find out that we can't get there that way, and then we will band-aid that and back off into something else. I would like to see a hard bottom line, it says, everyone go out there, low cost to space, in roughly about five years. Not 15 and not 20, and it's totally reasonable. Kendi says go to the moon, the same year we launched a Saturn. The programs back then were two or three year programs, and I'll get to that a little later. I think that is the highest priority we have, is reducing the cost of space flight. Number two, I think we ought to examine the way we do business. I think we need to confess to ourselves what our victories are and what our failures are, what we're good at and what we're not so good at. I think we need to be extraordinarily hard-nosed realists about how we are really doing. Space Station should not take 20 years. It took 10 years to launch four programs in the 60s. If we want to do a space station in five years, we need to get the will and the courage, and we simply need a deadline and put it on paper and go do it. I think to do all the things here that Buzz, that Walt, and that Ron put forward, I think the bottom line says just simply get on with it. Get on with low cost of space. Get on with the station and do it. When you all give us the privilege, such as go do a space station, and you say you're going to support it, and you let us embark on that initiative, we need to go do it, and we need to have hardware in orbit within four or five years. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It's only a matter of setting ourselves a hard standard and living with it. And I think the approach, even though I won't spend that many details on it, the approach ought to be come up with a simple, elegant, beautiful flying machine. Start there. Do not expect the design to evolve from 20,000 users. Come up with the best possible beautiful machine within one year as a concept. Spend one other year modifying that to meet the major users. Spend one other year to get to a critical design, and the next year, four years later, start building hardware. Just like we marched in the old days, there's no reason you can't flow the decisions. You start with critical decisions that cascade into other places. You attach names and dates, and you start marching around that flow chart that's on the own. You simply get on with it. That was number two. Number three, I would like to see us start embarking on what the human program will be beyond the space shuttle. I think we need to start on that now. I would like to see us have simple, elegant human machines, like a reusable capsule. 
which is totally forgiving. It is low tech. We already have the technology to do that. It is totally capable and it has high margins in terms of reserves and other kinds of capabilities. I'm not saying that is the way to go, but I'd say we should not forget some of that grand technology. Simple and elegant ways of doing things. We need to include that in our thinking about what we ought to be doing. Because the technology is great, the capability is there, and it's cheap, and we know how to do that today. We ought to include that kind of thing in our, in, in our thinking. Fourth, I would like to see evaluate our priorities in terms of how many resources we are spending nowadays to the reach the quest, the far out things which, which Buzz and Walt alluded to, and how many resources are in Earth orbital programs. I would like to see human programs which do not devour our entire space effort. We need to have human programs that we fly humans when we need humans in space, but we don't have to fly humans when we don't need to fly humans. And a reusable capsule is one way to approach that. The, a specific payload module could be another part of the thing. You fly a specific payload module, it's more details than we need to get into here. But I would like to see us pursue, the way to guarantee human spaceflight is to have a human space program that does not devour all of our resources. Another point is, is our collaboration, uh, which Walt mentioned. Our collaboration with partners is essential. We do need to collaborate. I love the partners that we have. But we need to do intelligent, creative partnering. We need to look at our strengths and our weaknesses, and we need to optimize how we collaborate and how we do partnership. We do not want to go into massive programs and try to weld cultures, how to weld different cultures, weld different technologies, and weld ourselves together. It does not serve either of us or serve spaceflight. Partnering needs to be very creative and very intelligent, and it needs to be very selective. My last point is, is that there is huge grassroots support out there. The Congress has supported spaceflight incredibly for the last uh, 35 or 40 years. We thank you for all that support. It has been absolutely loads of support. With all I do out there with the media, but also out there hands-on with the kids, yesterday I met with 500 high-risk, underprivileged kids, and I told them about space. I mixed it up with them. They do not consider themselves apart from the space program or the support of them. The safety net from them is in competition with space because they want to do Buzz's dreams. They want to be part of that. They don't want to go, that to go away. That is their hope. That is their future. It's their science. It's their technology. There is huge grassroots people support for space. But such as to not let them down, I think the key thing that we are doing in the space industry is we have got to get on with it. We got to simply do it. It doesn't mean it is any less in terms of its capabilities or its quality. We simply got to, when we get the initiative and the resources to do something, we got to get on with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank all our. Uh, panelists, uh, very enlightening and I think uh, some great vision for us to focus on. Uh, at first I would like to uh, allow uh, five minutes to Mr. Souter from Indiana to ask questions. First I just wanted to clarify for the record with Mr. Aldrin, you weren't claiming to be the role model for Buzz Lightyear, were you? Looked on a, a, a typical one, a catchy one, and uh, I'm happy about the choice. Pick Buzz anyway, right? They, um, and Dr. Musgrave, to, to start with yours, because it related to some of the others, are you suggesting that currently we have too many missions regarding NASA and can't do any of them with enough funds to back it up, given the limited budget? I don't work in Washington, sir, and I don't work the budget, and, you know, I'm coming from here looking up. I do not think it's a matter of resources. We said the station is going to cost $8.4 million back in, in 1984. <clears throat> By next year, 
1998, we will have spent 20 billion in 14 years, and there is not a single nut or a screw in orbit. If we simply get on with things in a logical fashion in which we set hard decisions, dates on the decisions, and attach names to those decisions and make it happen, that is the answer. One of the problems, and at least all of those of you who've, who've been in uh, space, Mr. Aldrin started out by saying, uh, had this happened, or this happened, or this happened, you would still be on the moon. One of the problems that we have when we get into defense contracting, for example, ITT Aerospace is in my district uh, with a number of plants, and uh, they have to make radios that can actually outlast their operators. In other words, uh, it has to, they put so much into making it perfect because of what Mr. Cunningham, and I hesitate to say Mr. Cunningham, by Mr. Cunningham I mean this Mr. Cunningham, that um, the, uh, that you said we're risk averse and that's a lot the cost uh, of a lot of these products in other words they that people look at it and say well we could do that for a lot less we could build a hammer for less than seven hundred dollars but you can't custom make a hammer that survives in all sorts of temperatures and all sorts of things with no risk what trade-off is people who've been out there in space would you be willing to make in the safety versus the risk if that achieves some of your low-cost objectives? And, and you know, I believe that <clears throat> as we look at space... Okay, as we look at space, and I'll restrict my uh, remarks to that, we need to, all of us, acknowledge that there are gains to be made through utilization of space, number one. Number two, there are and always will be risks in spaceflight. It's the most, uh, probably the most dangerous environment that man has ever gone into. So we know there's always going to be risks there. These risks, we're not going to be able to reduce them to zero, but at some level, they can be acceptable relative to the gains or the potential gains from it. And we need, ought to reduce those inherent risks as much as we can and then get on with the job, as Story says. Now. I don't believe it can be zero, but the problem that I was addressing is that in our society today, everybody is being raised to think that no risk is acceptable. So how can you come to an intelligent uh, assessment of what's acceptable? I mean, no risk is, is, seems to be the rule of the day. Now, we also have things to learn about risk, and we have learned over the years uh, I don't think I'm the only one up here that would say is when we look at the Russian space program, they've accomplished a tremendous amount with equipment that I would certainly consider much less sophisticated than we have. Uh, I don't endorse all of the things they do I, because I think there are some problems. But we have learned along the way that you don't have to have so many belt and suspenders as we have. We're seeing it right now on the Mir space station and you can still get by and you can still have some success. That, that's especially meaningful given that you were backup uh, on the Apollo 1 and certainly the uh, Challenger and the other things that occurred have in a sense scared a lot of the American people and it's so visible when there's a failure that there's a fear that the budget will evaporate. Uh, it's on national and international TV day after day when there's an accident. I would like to say something about that because as, as I think back on it, the risk always seems to be to seem bigger to those outside of the program. I don't recall, I think it was about three weeks after the Apollo 1 fire that our backup crew was promoted to the prime crew for the next mission. And other than a reasonable engineering judgment about having to fix a lot of things that we didn't even know what they were, I don't recall ever having concern that there was going to be some untoward risk. I knew we were going to do the best job that we could. It was part of what went with the job. And I don't remember ever spending one 60-second minute stopping and, and thinking about it. But today, anytime something happens, there is that concern. And for example, after the Challenger accident, I personally was concerned that Congress would find that too discouraging even to keep funding 
some of these programs. And we shouldn't. The very price of progress is risk. And I don't want to seem callous about human life, but lives are given up for progress every day. <coughs> well, some of our members would like to ask another round of questions, and we'll do that. Uh, Mr. Portman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks for the inspirational message from all of you. Uh, it, was, it was great uh, to hear from, from each of you as to your perspectives. And, and I'm getting a little pumped up about the space program here. Uh, I've, I've uh, traditionally been uh, uh, more of a deficit hawk uh, on, on all programs, including the space station, as an example, uh, Dr. Musgrave, and, and have not been able to support that for some of the reasons you outlined. Uh, but I probably come here as a lot of Americans, uh, having uh, enjoyed Mr. Howard's movie immensely and having grown up uh, watching uh, Buzz Aldrin and my constituent, Neil Armstrong, and uh, want to be supportive and, and want to see it done in, in a way that is cost effective and continues to be inspirational, particularly to our younger generation. Uh, Dr. Weldon has the Kennedy Space Center uh, as his asset in his district. I have Neil Armstrong. so. Uh, as my constituent, and I, uh, I really appreciated uh, Buzz your talk with me earlier and uh, your remarks today. My question to the to the whole panel, and I, I will direct it uh, to everyone, uh, but sort of building on what Dr. Musgrave was talking about is, uh, how can we, in an era of balanced budgets, remember in 1969 when the space uh, program really uh, got underway after the 1961 inspiration with regard to Apollo 11, we had. Uh, a balanced budget. We actually had a little surplus, I think, that, that year. And now we're $5.3 trillion in debt, I think, at last count, and running annual deficits. Uh, on the cost-effective side of it, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of really saving the program. In other words, if it's, if it's not cost-effective, I don't think we will have the kind of support, the grassroots support you're talking about. Uh, do you have some specific priorities, uh, Mr. Cunningham, Mr. Aldrin, Ron Howard, uh, that you think are the top priorities that we ought to focus on. You talked uh, some about uh, various programs and, and gave us a nice laundry list. How would you prioritize those? I think reusability uh, in, in our uh, launch systems is primary. Uh, and I think uh, affordability and, and reasonableness. We. Uh, designed finally uh, a shuttle system after several compromises and it didn't quite live up to our expectations. Uh, the uh, space station, as uh, Story pointed out, was uh, going to cost a lot less, going to be completed uh, sooner, and it didn't live quite up to our expectations. And the National Aerospace Plane is, uh, is no longer really a, a project. I think we should have a little caution about how we uh, chart the course and, and what we expect out of the, the next uh, commitment that we make, we should put it within, make sure that it's within our grasp and, and move toward, uh, I, I just don't think the American people are gonna wanna see us not quite make our objective the next time. Was, was one of the problems, uh, and I, I know there are lots of, lots of issues, I don't need, wanna get into the space station too much, but in a general sense, in terms of cost effectiveness, Mr. Cunningham talked about our international partners and the degree to which we should be subsidizing them. In fact, I think you said we, we need to set up a, a deal up uh, that's tough in advance and not subsidize our international partners. And some of you have, have touched on the issue, I think, indirectly of the politics here. In other words, with the space station, you might have different constituencies out there and different members' districts uh, that maybe, Dr. Or Mr. Cunningham, in your comments, you were saying that shouldn't be a factor. We should do this on the basis of the merits. And Dr. Musgrave is kind of saying that, I think, and saying, let's get on with it and do the right thing with our private sector partners. Is that part of the problem, Well, generally? I think over the years, I can recall back in uh, uh, the days of Apollo, one of the things that they were looking for was trying to make sure that some contractor in every state of the union, because it could grab the interest of the congressman. I believe that that is, while that may be politically the right thing to do. I don't believe that that is uh, economically or even on principle the right thing to do. You asked a question about the budget and how do we do these things. Uh, if you look back over the budget and in my proposed policy I, I make the comment that the uh, uh, 
federal budget has gone up by 165 percent in the last 30 years, and the NASA budget has gone down by 50 percent in terms of real dollars. So you're trying to get more and more for less and less is one of the things. Secondly, if you take a look at the budget for the last, uh, uh, I've got about 30 years spread out here, broken down by national defense, general science, mandatory payments, interest, and then other domestic programs, it's pretty simple to see that the uh, only monotonically increasing function is uh, other domestic programs over the last 30 years uh, being paid for out of the hides of the rest of the categories, and most notably national defense, which I, I object to that as well. And the general science and space category has gone down to, you can almost can't see it on this particular chart. Another specific suggestion I might make is that when you find that uh, through uh, a uh, recalculation that the revenues, that the tax revenues are going to go up over the next five years by $225 billion, that you contribute some of that, you find some ways of using that for something other than just additional entitlement programs. I see my time is up. Let me just make one final comment. Maybe Dr. Musgrave or Mr. Howard can <coughs> respond too. You, you started, Dr. Musgrave, saying that you were naive about politics and government. Uh, let me suggest this morning that uh, uh, you may be the least naive of, of all of us by focusing again on the, the cost-effective uh, issue here as your first priority and then really down the list. All, I think all of your priorities were uh, on target in, in terms of the political reality that we face. Do you have any comments on my earlier question? Um, no, I don't, sir. But I, I think that uh, that will let space open up, that will let space get privatized, and that will let the commercial sector, that will let it become market driven. I don't know exactly what the forces are. In terms of launch capability, the U.S. is now only launching 25 percent of commercial satellites. We used to do 100 percent. And I don't know exactly what is going on that, and right now there are satellites waiting to be launched and there is no launch vehicle. Uh, to get on as came out in the Space Congress in Cocoa Beach last week. The satellite's waiting to go, and there is no launch vehicle anywhere in the world to do that job. I do not know why the market has not driven the large aerospace companies to come up on their own uh, with a launch vehicle. And since that has not happened, I think we, the government, needs to take the lead. And once we have those vehicles, we can hand it, you know, over to industry. If I could add just a, just a kind of a, again, being a kind of a simplistic point, but, uh, uh, you know, coming from a, a business which is always trying to sell sort of simple ideas that people can grasp and decide to embrace, a movie idea, a television show, or so forth. One of the things that we talked about a lot when we were making Apollo 13 and talking about the space program and our love of it and its hope for the future and so forth, one of the things that was discussed was th that um, in, in a sort of a public relations uh, uh, tactic uh, and strategy, it, it might be valuable to actually come up with uh, two lists. One, as I mentioned in, in my comments, sort of the list of the things that we really have gained. And actually try to put a number on that. Actually try to come up with some calculation which says this has generated X number of dollars for our economy. This is what we estimate. Here's probably what it costs to generate the technology. And then secondly would be to say here are our projects. And whether it's the station, whether it's going to Mars, Whatever that objective, as you were saying, the objective that, that wants to be set and established, to actually come up with a list of three or four key objectives, knowing that sort of broad science is, is, is a part of it and there are going to be discoveries that uh, you know, no, nobody can, can quite uh, calculate. But come up with a handful of, of, of objectives and, apply, and project the same kind of numbers. To, uh, to them so that you actually are saying to the people, here's what it's cost, but look, if it's anything like what, ha you know, what we were able to generate out of the, the Apollo era with the technologies and the, or the shuttle era uh, and so forth, look how much we stand to gain on a, on a, nat on a military level, on a security level, on a, on a, on a business level and on, in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, cost, uh, you know, living, lifestyle. 
This guy sounds like he belongs in Washington, not Hollywood, doesn't he? He's got he's pretty, pretty good, pretty good idea. Thank you, Albert. Not just their intellect and the numbers, but you got to touch them right down here, and not just in the visual, but and spaceflight does that the images and the kind of stuff and and shedding light on people's place in the universe. And you all and done that this morning, very effectively. Thank you, John. Ohio, and I know you have another engagement, you're going to leave us, but thanks for being with us this morning. This time I'd like to turn to Dr. Weldon from Florida. I thank the chairman, and I too also want to thank uh, all of the uh, panelists. This has really been very enjoyable for me, and, and I could really sit here all day and talk space with you. Uh, let me begin, though, uh, by asking Mr. Howard. Uh, you know, I saw Apollo 13. It was a great movie. I took my daughter, and, and needless to say, it was a big hit uh, on the space coast of Florida, where where I hail from. But I don't follow the trade press uh, when it comes to Hollywood movies. Was that movie a a big hit or a medium hit? Uh, what would you say it was overall? <laughs> you don't have to give me numbers or anything like that, but it was it was a huge hit. A huge hit. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, worldwide. Worldwide, is that right? So my, mo my most successful film to date by, doubled, doubled any, any film in terms of, uh, you know, just, just ticket sales and, and revenues. Well, that's fascinating to hear that. So, so it was very popular in Asia and Europe and, and other places. Uh, because I remember during that crisis of Apollo 13 how uh, they were actually praying for the uh, astronauts in uh, the Vatican and I think the Pope uh, had the Italian people praying, so I could, I could readily see how it would have a, a, a huge worldwide appeal. Um, There's also, you know, we did a lot of uh, of international publicity uh, f for it, and to, you know, while there might be a degree of of uh, uh, cynicism uh, always expressed about America from uh, from journalists abroad. Uh, when it came to the subject of the space program, uh, I, they were f absolutely fascinated and continued to be the vast majority of the journalists that I spoke to, um, you know, inspired by it. And and uh, you know, I think their sense is that it's 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 uh, um, it's, it's it's one of the great accomplishments that um, that America has offered. And you know they're fairly dubious about America in in, in other areas in other ways, but here's one that uh, pretty much everybody seems to agree was a great great accomplishment. Did you get any feedback in terms of the impact it had on children? Um, I think you know if we're going to talk about man's future in space, we have to we have to talk about kids and education uh, because if we are going to go to Mars and if we are going to go on to other solar systems, it's going to be uh, the children. And I know my daughter very much enjoyed the movie, and she's still in great school. Well, I was I was uh, very pleasantly surprised by the way uh, children responded to the movie, and I, I didn't necessarily expect that. Uh, you know, I initially went into the film thinking it was a more or less an historical drama, a kind of a techno thriller. And, and I'd always been a big proponent of the space program and, 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 and followed it, but as I, I didn't really understand, uh, and still don't pretend to, honestly, but I didn't really understand the, the monumental endeavor that the space program represents. Uh, the years and years of, of, of uh, diligent, focused, Work and if I can add one thing about the the astronauts that I met and actually worked with in trying to understand the mission and research the mission, uh, all men um, well into their 60s as I was working with them and and the comment that that we all had was that they all they shared one thing an unbelievable passion uh, and uh, and and intellectual endurance. I mean. When you sat down and started talking about these missions, 
we could go on until two or three o'clock in the morning and you know the 30 year old guys were burnt out and the 65 year old guys were ready to talk some more and understand and explain and there's something you know very stimulating about that and I think that the feel tried to get that feeling into the movie and um, and and answer your question I was I was uh, uh, very pleasantly surprised by the way younger audience members responded to it uh, not just in terms of box office but I mean th just the the letters the the way the the uh, the film has been used to to teach um, not only the history of the space program but also uh, physics and and uh, and basic uh, science in schools and uh, you know so I, I, it for that moment I think the film helps stimulate people's uh, imaginations well I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about that passion issue because I know I see a lot of that uh, in my district a lot of those men and women that worked in the space program uh, they're still excited they still want to go back to Mars and and I just you know in closing I just like to open it up to the other panelists can can we really put a dollar value on on these kinds of things I you know when we start talking about going back to to the moon and and going to Mars I'm, I'm very well versed as a physician with the uh, medical spin-offs and the impact that that's had on impu improving people's health and and the material science breakthroughs that have occurred but just in the in the impact that it has in the the hearts and the minds and the passions of people and particularly our young people is it right for for men and women in congress to always be putting a dollar value on this program i think not uh... i think it's it's our future i think that you can put a dollar value on many of the things such as the statistic that ron has already mentioned but whatever you come up with in a dollar value is going to be greatly undervalued because you're not going to be able to prize what it does for the indomitable human spirit, what it does for education. Uh, I'm involved with an organization called uh, Space America Foundation, and we are preparing lesson plans and trying to get a series of, uh, it's a, for, for science and other uh, chemistry and a variety of courses in the Texas schools that uses about 30 videotapes uh, from the space program and the lesson plan ties in physics, mathematics, and you name it. And there's great enthusiasm from the, both the students and the teachers from being able to use examples from the space program uh, in their lesson plans and in, in their teaching. So it's a tremendous motivation. If, if we just look beyond that curtain there, you'll see what's going on. It's right there. value uh, people can estimate what the Apollo program cost us but what I've learned in the last uh, 27 years is that when I speak to people sooner or later there's almost a compulsion for them to tell me where they were when Neil and I walked on the moon and I'm trying to understand what that means to me it means that they value not the rocks that we brought back or what we said but what happened in their lives something happened that caused them to remember in a very positive a very satisfying way a particular moment and and i just stimulate the recalling of that and that's valuable to them how do you put a dollar sign on that when you multiply it by millions of people around the world i look forward to the year you want me to tell you where i was <laughs> no thanks I'm trying to remember where everyone was, uh, Congressman. <laughs> when I look at uh, the year 2030, I think there are going to be people alive who are going to cherish the moment and the sense of value that they experienced in their lives by seeing a nation step up and make a commitment shortly after the turn of the century to establish a foothold on Mars and see that grow. And in 2030, they're going to say, this started out with five people, seven, and it's now grown. We have 25 people thriving on the surface of Mars, and this is being supported internationally. Think of the, all the things that will come from the nations of the world dedicating themselves to the survival and the improvement of that small growing community. And if the asteroid comes and blows us all up, that may be the future of humanity. And, you know, don't, don't uh, think that that's sooner or later 
a responsible society needs to guarantee their own survival. And survival, I think, takes an advanced, stimulating spirit of humanity. And that's what space programs now is all about. It's not the balance sheet of what, what do we get out of it in terms of dollars. I thank, thank the, the uh, gentleman from Florida. We'll come back to some more questions, I think, for this panel. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Aldrin, a uh, couple things. You talked about the, and let me just say, this is an interesting uh, hearing we're having. Usually we're looking into problems in government and somebody breaking the laws and where dollars are misspent and all these types of things. Uh, you bring us today some vision that we don't usually get to, to look at and luxuriate in a sense and really for a backdrop of where we go in the future and probably as uh, members of politicians and members of Congress and just the nature of our work we don't do the vision thing enough to use as a backdrop of where we've been and, and what steps we need to take to get there so I, I think this is a, a, a very very good uh, exercise for us and I really appreciate your time and helping us do this uh, Dr. Allren, you talked about the Star Booster approach based on the use of existing hardware. Kind of tell us about that briefly. I, I believe we need a, a rugged, resilient uh, approach to access to space, to bringing down the cost of that. And I think that's best done by uh, a multi-stage vehicle and using something that exists and then making it reusable. The uh, Boeing system is, uh, uh, Boeing company has recently embarked on a sea launch program, and they're going to use, they've chosen for their rocket, not an American rocket, not a French rocket, but a Russian rocket, Ukrainian rocket, really, the Zenit. Uh, I think the first stage of that, with an airplane wrapped around it, called a Star Booster, uh, has multiple applications, first stage with a reusable upper stage or a capsule on top of uh, uh, engines and tanks, uh, as Story mentioned, uh, we can put payloads on top of that. Then that can be strapped three or four of them around a core stage, like the external tank from the shuttle. And now we've got the hotel in space for the tourists to go to. And that hotel in space re needs the same booster that it takes to go to the moon and Mars. So I, I think the public support will be behind uh, the, the reusable spacecraft and rocket systems that will help them get access to space. You uh, piqued my interest uh, when you're talking about solar energy. I happen to sit on another committee of energy and commerce issues. And one of the things we're talking about, you know, again, in the 60s and 70s, we're talking about nuclear energy and it was going to be the, for the future and electricity was going to be too cheap to meter. And today, basically, we'll probably not build another nuclear reactor maybe in this country, but that's a pretty good predictability. You talk about solar energy. How does that work and how can we bring it to Earth, and to, so to speak? I, I think in later panels, I know for a fact that we have some uh, really experts who can tell you how to uh, uh, harness the energy of the sun and solar power uh, in a better way than on the surface of the Earth. And uh, solar panels in space can then direct energy where it's needed on the Earth, and uh, some of the economies of beaming this energy from the distance of the moon using lunar resources to do this uh, prove uh, to be uh, superior economic approaches to doing this. Dr. Musgrave, you uh, talk about why we haven't been able to step up the, to the plate, so to speak, and uh, take the risk and why hasn't the private sector done that? And certainly somebody from government, I've come out of the private sector originally, uh, shouldn't be pointing fingers at the private sector, but I would suggest that probably as long as the federal government was going to take the economic risk and build the equipment and do the research and, and be involved, in, in a, unfortunately we get bogged down in the bureaucracy of the system where the private sector doesn't. It costs us much more to do it, but as long as we're willing to do it, the private sector is not going to take that risk. You want to talk about that a little bit? Just in your viewpoint. And you're probably right, sir. Bye. Um, but since in, in 35 or 40 years it hasn't happened and our entire 
space program and infrastructure depends upon that, I think we ought to do it. The, the government ought to do it? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm a, uh, I see sure. I'm a venture capitalist, uh, is what I do for a living, and invest in early stage companies getting started. I can assure you that when there is a profit to be made in space, that uh, private enterprise will certainly be willing to come in and make a profit. It can't be forced. It can't, it can't be able to look like it's a phony deal, and there really is no profit in it. So I take a slightly different perspective that maybe the only way that there's ever going to be able to get private enterprise involved in it is to have the infrastructure established by governmental bodies in one place or another, uh, whether that's the cost of transportation, which is the key to making a profit in space, or whether it's uh, establishing power systems in orbit that you then can plug into if you send your own satellite up and the like. But I don't believe that private enterprise, uh, and I see all these deals that come down the pike, we're not going to do it in space until there's a profit to be made in space. Mr. Howard, I just want to say I, I also enjoyed your movie. I happened to watch it at 40,000 feet halfway across the Pacific. It gave me a little bit of consternation from time to time, uh, wondering how you get down from there. But uh, uh, let me ask you, and again, from somebody who is out of the government sector, and uh, but when you make a movie, you have a goal, and you have so much money to make it, and you have a timeline. The longer that timeline stretches out, uh, most of our uh, people here who have been very much involved in space say, just do it. Is that the attitude that you kind of take with a movie, that if you take, if you stretch it out too long, you can't afford to do it? Well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, and it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a much different uh, situation uh, because, uh, the, the film distributor uh, is making an investment in a specific project, but that film distributor has a need, and that need is movies have a or, or television shows. Uh, and uh, so the real question is going to be not so much will they have the movie, certainly they're going to decide on movies, how much do they want to spend on each individual one and what will that film uh, return and for that reason there's always you know I mean that's why it's such an impossible business to predict uh, and it's so maddening who, who get into it as a as a business even though you know companies grow and 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 make profits it's uh, movie making is uh, everybody sort of imagines that it's uh, uh, completely out of control egomaniacs running around in this thoroughly undisciplined fashion but the fact of the matter is that if any movie project goes more than about 10 percent over its budget everybody's in trouble the director the producer everybody's humiliated it's bad it's a, it's a bad mark uh, and uh, and so they've somehow movie people have 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 been able to learn how to work toward a number and that's often what it boils down to is they make an estimate they agree and then there's a kind of a fluidity there's a kind of a give and take as they go working toward the objective keeping the number in mind and i think that's that's how filmmakers are expected to try to you know live up to uh, the, the targeted uh, the targeted number sometimes it doesn't work at all but I generally as I said it's usually about a five to ten percent differential well uh, my times expire but the three gentlemen uh, previous have spoken basically said as I understand it that one of our problems is we are risk aversion in this country and part of that's a political problem that we have as well but you as uh, mr. Aldrin said that you know we never have uh, probably explored this country or done the things that we've had to do if we we're going to worry about risk all the time. And there's a certain aspect of doing it, saying this is the job to do, uh, here's, our, here's our task, move forward and get it done. And to do it within a, a, a certain limit on, on dollars or expenditures. I hope that we could take that philosophy and start to move that forward. I think that's a, a very positive thing to come out of this uh, hearing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Souter. One of the things that all of you are really addressing and that we face is how to motivate people. 
Uh, part of our job as leaders is to lead and part is to be representative of where the people are. And unless if we get too far ahead of the people, we're no longer here. And this is a mixed bag in the general public. It's fine to say, oh, we like the shuttle, well, but not don't take my Medicare check. You know, uh, I want my road. Don't raise my taxes. And so we have to also catch their imagination. And I wanted to, to start with Mr. Howard, but then ripple this through because each of you touched on this. Um, you're in a very unique position because the baby boomers grew up watching you grow up. It's Opie, it's Richie Cunningham. Uh, then you made the transition into making movies that impact and reflect a lot of our lives. You're in a very unique position in it to influence the biggest groups of people in the society, and I commend you for having done so in a way that, that motivates. But as you go into that, you touched on something that Mr. Cunningham alluded to, and I wanted to, to, to mix these uh, two points. One is, is clearly science can motivate to a point, but it's doubtful. My dad left me a Buck Rogers gun, and we had the Jetsons, but the truth is, is that in spite of all the rhetoric, we wouldn't have had a space program without the Sputnik and without concern for the military questions. Um, that while movies like uh, Apollo 13 were moving and had a big audience, Steven Spielberg has tapped into another thing and uh, with the adventure movies of Star Wars, uh, with when you look at the sales of Independence Day, those were really militaristic versions of how outer space uh, works. And that captures the people's minds. And, and looking at what motivates people, one well-known consultant, Dick Moore, says it's love, hate, or love, anger, and hope and fear. And part of this is hope, part of it's, it's fear and how to capture this. And you said in your statement that the importance of the hope and the vision, but there also has to be this is important for us as a nation. And that it clearly, when you make movies, you had adventure in your movie, the suspense of whether somebody was going to die. I mean, it was a human story in addition to capturing the vision of space. We also, and one fundamental thing here is that while science is important, we do some things that may or may not be politically important because they're future the country. What Mr. Aldrin was saying, and um, uh, and the others, Dr. Musgrave and Mr. Cunningham said to a degree too, is the core question is, is that is it space that catches people imagination or is it humans in space is it the human aspect that when they think of a colony on mars a battle in space what does this mean to us are are we going to travel out there is it very are we so oriented ourselves that that has to be those two things have to be the key parts with science being something we do because it's important and we see the benefits. Could you address that some as somebody who especially is motivating people because if you don't motivate them, you don't get them there. Uh, and then each of you kind of touch on that because you've all been addressing this. How do we capture the human imagination, not just in kind of theory of what people should want to do, but how do you actually move them to say, yeah, we'll spend more money in this and we'll sacrifice a little to do it? Well, you know, I mean, there are probably a few things that, that that leap to mind. One is, since we're not involved in a, you know, a sort of a, a kind of, what was a sort of a veiled military uh, uh, conflict, uh, or the fear of one uh, at the moment, uh, th there is a kind of, you know, sort of like the spirit of accomplishment. Uh, and, 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 and I think we can apply a sort of a nationalism to that, although I agree with Dr. Musgrave that one of the things that I, that I love about exploration of space is this idea that we, you know, it pulls us all together. But at the moment, I think it, you know, in, in, in a way that <clears throat> we love to see Americans win gold medals, uh, I think that we're, as a nation, very proud of what we've accomplished. And I think that, we sh that there's a very legitimate reason to fear that somehow we will not con sustain this, this lead in this area. And that would be, that would be tragic. And I don't think that's anything that, uh, that very many Americans want to think about or, or face. Uh, I, I think that, that if we, I mean, I've had conversations with astronauts just sort of just talking about how, uh, you know, they've had more inquiries from, from other governments about ideas that they've put forth than, than, um, than the American government. Now, I'm not an expert. I don't know whether these individuals' ideas really had merit or not, but the fact of the matter is that we are not the only ones looking into the possibilities of, of, of space exploration. Yes, we're still, we're still in the lead. And, uh, and I think that there, 
that there that <laughs> with a, that there is a reason to fear, to have some fear. And while there's not a direct opponent, that um, the the idea of just sort of kicking back and saying, well, we've done that, is um, is is poor thinking. And I think that can be, I think that can be dramatized. And that was also why I was making the point earlier about everything that's been achieved and and the possibilities for achievement because if there is a superior energy resource um, that can be achieved well as a nation wouldn't we like to be the ones that present that to the rest of the world wouldn't we like to be in the lead there to you know and and so I mean I think that I think that there are ways of of presenting it as a as as, as very very important to our issue I mean to our lives in the future um, and, and of course, there's always this spirit of, of adventure and the pioneerism. I mean, that's, we're a nation of pioneers, so everybody relates to that. But then, if you need to sort of get to those, push those other buttons, I think that there are ways of, of re realistic way, you know, issues to raise. I would like to hear the other three panelists address this too. And if you could expand, in addition to national pride, is there reason to fear that if somebody got there first, they could control? us or other nations if they had the wrong motives or control energy sources and not be necessarily as willing to share with mankind. I might go back to the, the question that, uh, that went to Ron. The kinds of science that people can really appreciate are the science, the data that comes to them in a direct perceptual sense. It's hard for them to understand maybe an equation when they're not experts in that discipline. But when you can present something which is directly perceptual, such as an aesthetic visual image of astronomical data or of looking at Earth or other things, uh, that really does work. I have found a human experience, they do vicariously want to go into space and we are just representative of them and have that privilege. But if we penetrate the head and the heart, they are far more appreciative in terms of what you give them as opposed to a list of what you did and a chronological history of events that occurred. If you give them what is going on in your head, your experience of the work that you are doing, your perception of how your body is doing in this environment that it was not designed to be in, then that touches. If you can present it and let them live space through a character uh, the same way uh, Ron's movies does or the Spielberg ones, it is always through some characters that the drama takes place. And so to let the public live that through, through a personality, I think, is important. I've always, I think almost always, found that when I'm abroad, there seems to be more grassroots enthusiasm about space and about what we're doing. Some of it you might put in the, probably the nature of envy in the sense that they don't have the same level. Maybe they would get more blasé if they did, but I doubt it. I think that's kind of a characteristic of the Americans. We tend to get this tremendous accomplishment, then we start taking it for granted and we just get all blasé about it. I already, I already did that. I've also always been confused by the fact that for the last 20 years at least I've listened to the debate and when I start talking about the space budget, usually it's a fight every year, and congressmen say well, I don't see the support in my district, or it, it just doesn't seem to be a gut-level issue. And yet, in my involvement with that same public out there, I always feel it's at least a 90% positive response. Even when I discount it for the fact that they're talking to an astronaut and, and would like to encourage me, it always seems to be a gap between what you gentlemen may be getting from your district and what I would see if I was out there in that district. Uh, and I sometimes wonder when we look at these priorities, because we're, we have those trade-offs. I'm at the age where I'm concerned about Medicare now, too, myself. But there has to be some sacrifices someplace. But is it the public's priorities? Or sometimes, could it not be the politicians uh, defining the public's priorities by making appeals to the electorate in certain areas? 
there is no question that when it comes to pocketbook issues, it's a more effective appeal to somebody if you're going to give him something than it is if he sees that you're spending something for it. Uh, going back to John F. Kennedy's statement, he wasn't reflecting any grassroots uh, push to announce a program like this. I mean, he was stepping out in front, and I don't think it's ever going to be the grassroots that's going to demand one of these kind of programs. Yeah. The fact is, though, I remember a bomb shelter in our basement where we were putting things away and we were fearful that if the Russians got up there, I, I think there was more grassroots support to do something than your, I, I understand that maybe not in the way he was, but there was a grassroots support that was driving from a defense standpoint. Well, and there's also no question that there really was a space race and that was essentially a battle in the Cold War. It was what it really boiled down to. Uh, but when I'm talking about going to putting a man on the moon, it that kind of went beyond just defending against rockets in space. And uh, I think that it takes somebody to verbalize this vision and it gets accepted by the public if it appeals to their heart. And it, it has to, something in here has to grab you that makes you excited about it. I think if I, if I understand your question, the public participation and identification and association with what we're doing in space is essential. Look, look at the popularity. The world's most popular museum is, is where we are right now. Uh, the popularity of space camps, of challenger centers, the, the young people and, and adults want to see a hands-on participation, whether it's in, in the next several years, someone having the experience for a limited time to control the movement of a robot on the surface of Mars. Sure, it's a robot, it's a machine, but it's, there's a person and, and he's looking forward to his involvement in doing that. And vicariously through uh, uh, virtual reality, I think people want to get an involved and be a participant in this. And that's why they come to all these museums. And, and I think that that's why they want to participate, maybe it's vicariously, in, in cheering uh, the winner of a random drawing of shares for a ride to go into space, or they're taking a chance of some sort and then getting a little bit of a prize. Uh, I, I, I think it's that kind of participation and involvement is absolutely essential to uh, broaden and, uh, and, and give uh, concreteness to this thin veneer of support for adventure that is off into the future, weighed against the press of the immediate demand. I, I think we need that continued involvement. Thanks for your efforts here today and also just across the country in helping boost the interest. Dr. Weldon, do you have any questions? Just have a quick one uh, for uh, Mr. Cunningham. Um, how did we get to uh, where we are, uh, assuming your analysis here is correct, and I believe there is some validity to what you're saying, uh, going from a society that's willing to take chances to uh, a risk-free society, uh, you know, was it Vietnam, uh, was it, uh, you know, Hollywood playing a role, or, or is it the trial attorneys? I mean, how, how did we transition to where we are now? <laughs> Assuming your analysis is correct, is it all of the above? <laughs> uh, no, I think I could, I, I could be a little bit more specific than that. It will get, it's quite a political statement. I mean, I believe that uh, uh, for 30 or 40 years in this country, we have been moving towards a uh, what's been characterized as a liberal philosophy that uh, is wants to do things for people, not hold people responsible, uh, not challenge them. Uh, uh, you know, every time you turn around, there's talk about safety nets. Uh, instead of meeting obligations, taking a challenge, being responsible for yourself and your own results, it takes a lot longer discussion than I have here to say how that slippery slope got started and, the, and each time it moves slowly and inexorably along, uh, we almost forget where it started at one time. But I believe that is a part of it. It's a difference in the kind of philosophy that's been uh, projected in this country for many years. I think I see a swinging of the pendulum back to some degree. Uh, but as long as we 
don't hold people accountable for their actions so that when they do take a risk, uh, they see that there's both a possibility for reward and failure. I'm one of those that believe that it's a tremendous luxury that we have in this country is the right to fail. Because without the right to fail, there can be no real wins, no real victories. It's the opposite side of the same equation, and we have to have that opportunity, and you have to be able to see the failure in order to know that you want to succeed next time. How many people do you know? How many stories have you heard in this country of those who have tried and tried again, and eventually they see, succeed tremendously? We have the greatest society in the history of the world to allow that to happen. And if we don't kill it, it will go right on happening. But it's our responsibility to see that it doesn't stop. So if I understand you correctly, it wasn't Hollywood, the trial attorneys, uh, it was Washington, D.C. that has uh, led us down this path. I, I, of those, the, the, the characters that you named, I would say, yeah, Washington's probably more responsible than the others. Well, I've only been doing this three years, sir, so I don't, don't hold you responsible. Hold me accountable. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, I just thank this panel. You've uh, been incredibly uh, candid. Uh, you've given your time, and I know it's a precious commodity, and we've had you before us almost two and a half hours, which is more than we should ask anybody to have to do. Uh, thank you very much, and I just have to be remiss. We've talked about uh, <clears throat> Mr. Howard's film. Uh, Dr. Al uh, Alder, I understand you're writing a book, Encounter with uh, Tiber, and uh, which is a uh, space uh, analogy and taken from a lot of your own experiences, and I'm sure uh, you're going to get a lot more people involved in what space is all about through this endeavor. So thank you very much, and thanks for being with us today, and uh, really appreciate your uh, candidness and, and uh, contribution. If I may, I would ask our second panel to come forward. I may ask, I would ask our second panel to stand to be sworn in before I formally uh, introduce each of you. <clears throat> Please raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the uh, sh record show that the witness has responded in the affirmative. Please be seated, gentlemen. I'd like to uh, formally welcome our second panel, uh, Dr. Peter Glaser who served as a project manager for Apollo 11, Dr. Richard uh, Bernenzen, a professor of physics at the American University, Dr. David Webb, who serves as a consultant to develop university research programs in space science, and Dr. David Criswell, who serves as director of the Institute of Space System Operations in the University of Houston. And gentlemen, if I ask you, if you'd kind of uh, summarize your statements, we'll try to keep them to five to seven minutes in that area and uh, your written record will be entered your written testimony written uh, entered into the record so gentlemen thank you very much and uh, please proceed uh, dr glaser mr chairman i'm delighted to be able to 
Okay. And uh, you almost have to talk right into him to get the, a big coverage. So, I'm sorry. Dr. I'm Dr. delighted to uh, be invited to speak on a subject which has been of interest and my major effort over the past 40 years, and that is to look at the sun and seeing best way that we can get solar energy converted in a way which we can then beam back to Earth to serve the major needs we foresee in a global sense. When I first came up with this concept in 1968, officially, when I talked about it, it looked like science fiction and President Kennedy's plan to land a man on the moon within 10 years was considered a great gamble. I believe that this subject of power from space for use on Earth is a logical outgrowth of all of the work that we have done in this country in space because it is not just something that people will admire because of prowess, but people will require because of the necessity to continue to live a better life and to ensure that we not destroy the ecology of the earth by going the wrong way. Therefore, I'm an enthusiast for solar energy in space and on the ground. I've had the privilege of testifying before both Senate and House committees, and I would refer much of the uh, basic and uh, a lot of the information that I presented there for you to uh, examine. I've also uh, will present you more updated information. Now, what's important that NASA and the Department of Energy studied this whole solar power satellite aspect from 1970 to 1980, and the conclusion was that no single constraint was identified which would preclude the development of solar power satellites, just the name I've given it for either technical, economic, environmental, or societal reasons. That was the conclusion. Now, in the year 1995 to 1996, NASA performed a study, and that study concluded, just, I just got the final report, new technologies and system approaches developed during the past 15 years have the potential to make solar power satellites far more feasible than was traditionally believed. That is the latest information from NASA. I believe that power from space should be an integral part of global development goals. It is an acceptable approach to decrease the unsustainable rate of population growth by meeting the insistent demands for higher living standards. Currently, we see the population reaching some 10 billion people by mid 21st century, and one half will live in cities uh, by 2000. And the current migration of 150,000 people per day into cities will increase to about 250,000 with some major effects. Today, we hope to reach the goal of three kilowatt per person, which is about 30 billion kilowatt. Now that's thousands of modern nuclear power plants with problems we have not solved yet. Therefore, increasing energy supplies and generation methods comparable with the ecology at affordable costs will be required on a global scale. There is a widening recognition that it is power from space is relevant and beneficial to life on Earth, and the growing international interest is a proof thereof, because today people are working on this subject in Canada, in China, in Europe, India, Japan, Russia, Ukraine, and certainly the United States. And these are things which are in the literature for everyone to see. This is not just some hearsay. Space power systems have been demonstrated of increasing scope with wireless power transmission across limited distances on Earth, 
to maintain high altitude, long endurance aircraft forever if you want up in air and beaming power from a rocket to a spacecraft, which was done by the Japanese. We know that we can do this kind of technology because it is based on 100-year-old science and technology developed by Hertz, developed by Nikola Tesla. I have proposed a stepwise SPS solar power satellite development program to permit near, mid, and long-term benefits of this application. We need to have an appropriate framework for these operations because this eventually will be international, just as communication satellites are international. And it is the international technical community has shown that the objective of solar power from space for Earth can be realized and that well-planned future efforts can achieve the promise of space endeavors, which you have just heard from the previous panels. All of those things can be the basis for doing the applications I'm talking about. I know the first development steps are always the hardest to take, to demonstrate that the promise of power from space is real, but placing increasing reliance on the inexhaustible energy of the sun will ensure that all forms of life can continue to flourish on Earth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Glasser. Uh, Dr. Berenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, and congratulations on holding this hearing and where you decided to hold it and when. You know, we are surrounded by the icons of this nation of this century. They're precious to us. A moment ago, I went on the outside and met the people there, thousands of them men and women and children and grandchildren and grandparents of every race, creed, color, national origin, male, female. Do you have any doubt of the interest in space across this nation? Those are not astronauts, those are not scientists, those are not engineers, but it's the most popular museum in the history of the world. And think of what is here today. Just behind us we have lunar landers. Think of the museum a century from now. If we have the proper verve, Mars landers, not just lunar rocks, but Mars rocks, asteroid rocks, water from the moon of Titan, even hydrocarbons from the distant Titan itself. And then consider what all we might do, even communicate with human beings and habitats elsewhere. I happened to be at the opening night of Mr. Howard's spectacular film, and I saw it in northern Virginia in a crowded theater. At the end of the film, for the first time in my entire life, I saw everyone in that theater, that jaded audience of Washingtonians, rise to their feet as one, cheering, applauding, screaming in adulation, in part because it was such an inspiring movie, but also because it was sheer Americana. It was, we can, we did, and we will again. Well, if I may turn to my comments. Those who came before us expanded their compass and went beyond. History shows that the peoples who pursued their quest maintained a national vitality and reaped rewards beyond their initial hopes. Our forebearers also looked at the night sky in awe. Many people today want to reach the next frontier, to venture from cradle earth and to voyage to other worlds. Humans crave exploration. They want to do more than survive. Today we are poised to explore the greatest frontier of all, with humans and machines working together. As this millennium ends, this nation can leave an inspiring and challenging legacy for the 21st century. It can set long-term plans to explore the solar system, place humans on Mars, and build outposts off of our planet. For such long-term, far-reaching efforts, the final rewards will differ from what we forecast today. Moreover, the most pro important things in life, those we cherish the most, do not permit a cost-benefit analysis. Try computing the cost benefit of patriotism, or courage, or love. But with limited resources and pressing needs, the nation should consider its desire for and commitment to exploration. How much do we really want to visit other worlds? Are we willing to pursue work that will bring immediate benefits, but whose major rewards will come in the future? We shall find no hospitable world trivially ready for colonization, and the effort to get there will be substantial but consider 
the potential benefits. From a major stimulus of technology, research and development, and science education, to epochal findings in planetary sciences and many other fields, such endeavors will boost diverse industries, stimulate much of our national economy, and create jobs at all levels in many disciplines, and present a unique, even historic opportunity for American leadership in the world community by focusing efforts of many nations on this greatest of all human adventures. Of this, we can be sure. Humans will explore Mars and go to the furthest reaches of our solar system and beyond. The insightful question is not if humans will do so. The right questions are who will do it and when. With proper planning, the United States can offer the answer. Americans, early in the next century. T.S. Eliot stated, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Was he right? And ultimately, will our voyages of discovery return us to where we started, to our planet, our nation, ourselves? Through long-term space exploration, we can establish our niche in time. Centuries from now, even voluminous history books will truncate much of what engrosses us today. Recessions, political races, even many wars in time, all these will become brief entries in the sweep of human achievement. But a few extraordinary accomplishments will tower forever. Apollo 11 landing surely will be one of these. Human landing on Mars will be another, and proof of the existence of life, present or past, on another world would stand as a benchmark in all of time. We wish to explore for tangible reasons, too. Such efforts will increase our understanding not only in scientific fields, but also in management, business, and even the arts and humanities. Yet another drive compels us to explore, for we are Americans. No other people in modern history have benefited so much from exploration or contributed so much to it as the people of this nation. It is our tradition and our culture. It was from the experiment of our democratic society to the reaches of our scientific quests. We are explorers. Without exploration, we could not be. For the next generation, for the nation's third century, space exploration will constitute a natural continuum of the American adventure. What then should this exploration be? Superficially, it would be a plan to take robots and then humans to Mars and eventually elsewhere in the solar system. But saying only that would no more encapsulate it than saying that Yosemite is just real estate or the Star Spangled Banner is just a song. Space exploration constitutes many things, tangible and intangible. Among them, science and technology, that to enable the, the exploration and that that the exploration will enable. Economic benefits prompted by significant stimulus of the nation's most advanced technologies. Quality of life. Although space exploration deals with other worlds, its applications are actually down to earth. Space exploration can make our lives more comfortable and even more secure. Education both for future scientists and engineers and for scientifically literate citizens generally. International cooperation, both with our traditional allies and our traditional adversaries. National pride and international respect. Apollo brought pride and respect. 21st century space exploration, even bolder and even more ambitious than Apollo, will do so as nothing before in history. A sense of adventure, daring, and even heroics. Young people need to know that their nation chooses rigorous goals, applies itself resolutely, and achieves its objectives. And space exploration will create a new generation of heroes. As historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. has argued, if our society has lost its wish for heroes and its ability to produce them, it may have turned out to have lost everything. To undertake such exploration will require courage. It entails risk, even danger. But we should remember Ralph Waldo Emerson's dictum, every wall is a door. Can we find the door? If we do, will we open it? Shall the nation continue its bold and daring heritage? Adults ponder these matters, yet they actually belong to the children. This is the stuff of their dreams and will shape their world. Children gaze at the night sky in awe. Adults caught up in the day-to-day -day concerns can forget the wonder and lose the mystery. What a loss when that happens for childlike curiosity 
has inspired American achievement. Beyond the benefits for space, technology, the economy, quality of life, education, and even pride, such exploration is about providing a vision. This undertaking will span decades. Many of its principal beneficiaries are now infants or not yet even born. Our foresight and determination will become their lodestar. More than a major NASA program, a scientific quest, or a technological challenge, space exploration is a reaffirmation of American leadership writ large and left indelibly on the pages of history. It is America at its best, doing what only America can do on such a scale. Dream, plan, invest, achieve, and lead our people and people everywhere to old aspirations, continuing hopes, and new accomplishments. Lead them to other worlds and to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. <coughs> Dr. Criswell. Thank you, Committee Chairman and uh, Subcommittee members. I hope you have a copy of this presentation. I'll be making reference to pages four and six. I'd like to talk with you about the lunar solar power system to supply Earth with commercial electric power. It's generally not recognized, but... Yes, is this better? It's generally not recognized, but the essential assumption on most energy projections is that the world will stay poor. Most people will stay impoverished. Worldwide prosperity in the 21st century requires more energy than can be supplied by conventional, non-renewable sources, such as coal and shale and non-breeder uranium systems, or even terrestrial solar power, and this includes biomass and photovoltaics. Present power systems are limited by their fuel resources, the increasing cost of non-renewable fuels, and by the very high cost of the terrestrial solar renewable systems and the backup power supplies that they need and long-distance transmission lines. In addition, they all impact the environment. I think a goal for the U.S. space program and even the world space program is that by 2050, we should supply all 10 billion people in the world then with at least two kilowatts each of electric power. That's a goal of 20,000 gigawatts of electric power. Well, that's about six times more power than the world produces now. It's equivalent to what is required by Western Europe to provide the high standard of living that they have there. I think a solar energy system based on the moon can provide this electricity and can provide it at a cost that's about three to possibly 30 times less than the wholesale cost of electricity now. You'll be delivering the power by engineered photons, microwaves, such a way that the system is intrinsically environmentally clean and rather than depleting Earth's resources, can actually increase the resources of Earth. There's enormous growth capacity in this system. I believe that it can grow to somewhere between 100,000 and a million gigawatts of delivered power, far more than we need now and enough for several centuries of growth. I'd like you to refer, if you could, to the fourth page of that presentation set, which gives a schematic of this power system as seen from outside of a city on Earth. The sun is the source of the power. It's an operating fusion reactor. The moon is the recipient of the solar power. It exists. It's in the right orbit. The same face always faces Earth. And you build power bases on the two limbs of the moon as seen from Earth so that one or the other is sunlit and can deliver the power. The power is uh, handled by changing sunlight to electricity to microwaves and then to controlled low-intensity beams that deliver the power down to very lightweight microwave receivers on Earth. All of the key technologies and operations, surprisingly enough, are already demonstrated. There's no fuels, there's no furnace, there's no ash or long distance transmission lines in this system or even massive equipment. It can be a very long life system that de dependably de delivers power that very importantly is independent of the biosphere. The beams are unaffected by rain, fog, dust, the things that normally interfere with ground-based power. If you could review, uh, refer to biograph number six, or slide six there, that's a uh, picture of a prototype power base, a demonstration power base on the edge of the moon. In that place, the Earth always stays fixed in the sky, eternally. Each base is huge, but it's composed of small units called power plots. There would be tens of thousands of these, and this is simply a representative view of one, one type. 
A power plot consists of local solar arrays, small microwave transmitters, and reflectors, all primarily fixed on the lunar surface. And they would be made out of the local materials. I think the talks that you heard by Buzz Aldrin and other astronauts and the evidence you see around here of our visits to the moon are examples of one of the best investments this nation could have conceivably made in its future. We know what's there, we know the common resources, and we know that we can convert those in to these fairly simple power components that I've just described. They would be generated by mobile factories that are placed on the moon and put out hundreds to thousands of times their own mass in components. What that means is the cost of transportation does not affect the cost of power in a strong way. All of these steps can be clearly demonstrated on Earth before you ever go back to the moon, and the industrial size demonstration can be done for a fraction of the present U.S. investments in space. In summary, this lunar power system, I think, can provide Earth a second source for its critical energy needs on a worldwide basis. This will be net new energy that can be used to underpin clean environmental growth and new prosperity that's not possible in a way that when you use depletable resources. From the standpoint of the vision spoke about, spoken about by our previous speakers, this will enable the economic establishment of a two-planet economy, the Earth and the Moon are the two planets, which can grow self-sustained. A future space program could literally grow off the taxes generated by the new economic growth of this two-planet economy and fundamentally will provide humanity a way to grow into cislunar space and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Webb. Chairman Hassett and members of the committee. Yeah, I'm you to speak into the mic. Uh, right. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, uh, Chairman and members of the committee, it's my honor and pleasure to be here today. I must admit to a certain degree of deja vu in listening to the excellent uh, presentations you have had by particularly by the members of the astronaut uh, Buzz Aldrin and Walter Cunningham and and uh, Story Musgrave and also the excellent presentation by Ron Howard I, I had the honor to have been a, a member appointed by President Reagan to the National Commission on Space which uh, you may know or may remember was a congressionally mandated study of the future of the American space program through the year 2030 that took place in 1984 and took a year and we reported in 1985 in a 215 page document that outlined all the possibilities and many of the problems that we have discussed today. For the record, the Pioneering the Space Frontier was the name of the Commission report. This is the first section, and I think that you have it in your briefing papers. I would very much like, with your permission, uh, Ch Mr. Chairman, to have this first section read into the record. Without objection. Thank you. It was the, the whole concept of what we have heard today and the whole concept of what we heard on the Commission was the necessity for the United States to maintain its lead in space and at the present time we have dropped the ball in a very large way. The problem that we see right today when we announced in uh, this Commission report that we would, we should by the year 2000 have developed a low-cost cargo transfer vehicle, a low-cost manned space vehicle. We would not just have a space station, which we were told would be in operation by 1994, but we would have a spaceport by the year 2000. By the year 2005, we were suggesting we should be back on the lunar surface. We should develop mining operations on the moon. We should learn how to live off Earth. And by the year 20. 10, we would have a full-scale manufacturing uh, and replenishment facility and, uh, on the moon, and we would then build the Mars spacecrafts, including Buzz Aldrin cycling spaceships, and we would leave for Mars, and we'd be on Mars by the year 2019. That was 11 years ago, Mr. Chairman. In that 11 years, if you look today at what has happened, not one single element that we were suggesting 
that should be in place by the year that by the turn of the century has even been begun except the space station which is eight years late and 25 billion dollars over budget and all the other elements I we're talking about a reusable space vehicle now it'll be eight years to ten years before that those space vehicles can possibly come on stream we need your committee, if I may say, needs to ask what has happened that causes the United States, the preeminent technological power in the world, to be unable to produce a space station in the time that the president challenged the nation to do it. Ten years, one decade. We have not yet, as uh, I think it was Walt Cunningham said, got one nut or bolt in space at this time. There is something that is the matter. If I may make a suggestion, and I do so in, in my uh, testimony, the manner in which we develop technology, the way we regulate technology in this program is unique to the United States. We are the only industrial nation in the world that demands an annual review of every technology program that we have underway. And in doing that, we invite a growing opposition as the program moves along and becomes more expensive. And we invite every year that it'll be re-examined and either cut back or apportioned or reapportioned, and we're back to square one. We cannot ask our engineers and scientists to keep this nation in the forefront of technology if we are second-guessing them every single year. This, I understand, is a congressional prerogative, and I understand that the m monetary power of the budget is a prime thing for the Congress, as it should be. However, there may be other ways, and I am suggesting in, in my testimony the creation of a technology development fund which would operate very similar to the great foundations of the world in which the Congress would apportion a certain amount of funds every year to cover the programs, the new technology programs that were going, and would give the money for a set period of time, which I would like to see five years, but you probably could not do that, but maybe even four years, two congressional terms. If that was done, there would be a steady funding of technology. If there was steady funding of technology, we would have a space station in space now. We would have single stage to orbits, reusable space vehicles, and we would not have this desperate cancellation of programs. The National Air and Space Program was to give us a single stage to orbit airplane. We spent $2.4 billion. We worked for five years. We made enormous advances, and then the program was canceled. No question, gone. This, this is damaging our leadership in space. All the other nations in the world uh, once upon a time believed that we had such a lead in the, in the development of space that they would never be able to catch up. And yet look at it today because of the fact that we have not created a new launch vehicle in the last 20 years we are falling behind we have lost 70 percent of the world's space launch market in the same period of time it is a tragedy of enormous proportions and we don't see it until it comes and bites us we are the only industrial space nation that has not built a rocket engine in 25 years the Russians have built seven, the Chinese have built three, the Japanese and Europeans have built two each, India has built two. We have built none. And then we wonder why we're losing the space market. If we do not understand and if we do not unleash our programs to be able to be fulfilled the way we try and develop them in the beginning, we will always be doing that. And in doing that, this country will lose its leadership as sure as we are here today. It is a given 
Well, there are very powerful entities, not the least of which is going to be China, that is just starting, Japan, Russia. Russia right now is in plenty of trouble, but they will get together and they are a powerful competitor. We need, honestly, to review how it is that we handle our space uh, technologies and how we handle technologies generally here and try and develop new ways. And this is a real challenge to the Congress, and I realize that. And it's a real challenge to the entire community to be able to adjust to something new. But that is what I would like to see happen, because this is the greatest country in the world, and we must, must lead the space race, if that is what it is, or are venturing out onto the next frontier. Thank you. Thank the gentleman, uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Dr. Dr. Webb, I wanted to uh, follow up briefly on your uh, technology fund uh, question. Are you viewing that as a space technology fund? No, I think it should be a technology fund generally, but I, of course, would naturally, if it came down to it, say a space one first. And how would you <laughs> see this different, say, from the National Science Foundation, which gives grants? Well, the National Science Foundation, however, does not give grants to particular programs over a long period of time. They, they make suggestions and study the programs and, and give funding uh, uh, when required, but not, not in what I'm talking about. I'm basically saying the Congress, when it decides to give funds to a program, should give the funds in total. That's what the Europeans do. That's what the Japanese do. Five-year program. They get the funding guaranteed for five years, and our funding is not. Um, constitutionally, we, we don't have the right to bind the next Congress. Uh, I understand, if I may suggest, that this be taken off budget. Right. The, I'm the, that's why, uh, for example, National Endowment for the Arts, you can forward fund some grant-type programs. Uh, the problem is, is that if a given Congress forward funds it, it means the whole budget item has to be hit that year as opposed to being calculated over the five years. Um, and that's uh, also the danger if it goes into a technology fund uh, that isn't specified for space that very could, the political pressures for high definition television or something could easily overwhelm. Uh, but it's an in intriguing idea. Would you see this fund having any private sector matches or? Yes, I think it'd be very important if it could have private sector matches. And of course that will have a competitive uh, issue involved in it because uh, we don't know what, I mean, a company will not match it if they don't think that they're going to get a contract. And that just makes things very difficult. In addition but to contra contracts, would you have some sort of uh, early rights to certain patents or yes, access? Yes, abso absolutely, would have to. I think the stevenson Weidler Act, uh, very nearly passed in, uh, I think it was uh, 1981, uh, went into a lot of this in great detail, and I think it might be useful to review uh, that, that act as a possible uh, model. Do you see that uh, getting into solar energy questions too? In oh, indeed. I think that everything we've heard today and Dr. Glazer and Dr. Criswell's uh, 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 proposals are a very necessary thing. And they were reviewed, Dr. Glazer's was reviewed particularly by the National uh, Academy of Sciences back in 1978. But since then we've done nothing with it. And it is a great tragedy because what is going to happen is the Japanese, in fact, if Dr. Glazer would probably tell you, he's been spending most of his time in the past 10 years in Japan because they're the only ones who are saying to him, come on, Dr. Glazer, tell us how to do this and we will control the electricity to the world. Um, Important th thing. That segues into my uh, next question. There's really two parts of this, Dr. Berenson mentioned this, at least in his uh, written testimony, the question of what you just said there related to the Japanese dominating the energy question, but you alluded to the Chinese. Um, uh, in the international agreements on uh, peaceful uses of space or non-dominance of certain categories, is China a signatory to any of this? No, the People's Republic was not that I know of. What about I North Korea? Or I don't yeah. think so. We have, a, we have an expert in international law right in the audience. Maybe they would know. That's my knowledge. They're not. Oh, because one of the problems here is, is that, um, that one of the problems here is, is that if only nations that are friends sign the treaty, it's not as 
quite as far-reaching as if we had those who may, in fact, be competitors. Uh, that uh, do you see? Um, could you follow up, Dr. Glazer, with the Japanese question a little bit? And, and indeed, do you see uh, any willingness out of them to do joint efforts if it was pursued? How, uh, or is some of this just so competitive that certain streams are going to be trying to dominate? And in fact, that desire to dominate may in fact advance science. Let me just also talk about the Chinese, because uh, at the International Astronautical Federation Congress, which took place, uh, last year in Beijing, uh, a Chinese uh, scientists from the Shanghai Power, Space Power Institute uh, gave uh, a plenary lecture, which actually is a Peter Glazer lecture. And uh, their conclusion was very simply stated, we want to work with others internationally on making this come about. So I believe that it is a possibility for this country to enter into discussions with China, because he did not say that as an individual. He was talk, uh, saying this as Chinese policy. As far as the Japanese are concerned, my first contacts with the Japanese was shortly after the oil shock of 1973. They had the greatest incentive as a nation to develop solar power satellites or lunar power satellites. I think that they have understood it, and if you look at what they have done, they have systematically done all the right steps on a small scale, very inexpensive. It's all published. You can get it in, uh, from them. There's no secrecy about it, and it's all organized by MITI. And they have developed a way of enveloping the industry people. This is an industrial project, not a space project. Space is part of it, and they have done some exceedingly important experiments. I just mentioned one or two. For example, they've flown an airplane which was held up by wireless power transmission. That was done as part of their international space year effort. They have done a rocket experiment which beamed 800 watts from a rocket to a satellite. At minimal cost, this was done by the Institute of Space and Astronautical Science. Now, we have not even attempted to duplicate something like that. Can you imagine what it takes to do that? It's a very challenging thing they've done it. They have, by the way, they're not the only ones who've done it. The Russians beamed from space station Mir, somehow nobody followed that up, to a Swedish satellite. They had wireless power transmission from Mir to a Swedish satellite. So if I can say that this is an internationally uh, very top grade project, and whether it's at the beginning stages now, that's where we have to be. Because once they decide they do it in orbit, or eventually, and I fully agree, uh, it'll have to be done eventually on the moon, we will be behind the eight ball because these other nations take this very seriously. The conferences, I would invite you to attend the next conference in Montreal, SPS 97, August 23rd to 28th. There are all the representatives of these nations who've been working on it. And I think it would be interest for people from Congress to at least listen to what they are saying. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weldon. I thank the chairman. Uh, I just want to follow up with a couple of technical questions to uh, Dr. Glaser and uh, Dr. Criswell. Uh, the Earth is turning, and if you have a uh, power base on the moon transmitting power, is it, is, is, do you have the ability to move the antenna on the moon and, and keep that receiver on Earth always on track? Uh, or is, is that the function of the satellites? I'm just a little confused how this would all work with everything moving, the moon orbiting the Earth and the Earth spinning underneath it constantly. Is, is, you said the technology is all there, is that correct? Yes, the uh, basic 
the basic approach with the lunar system, the simplest system is you have the bases on the moon and they send power to a receiver on Earth when the receiver can see the moon, which is half of the day. You'd actually only use about 40% uh, of the day. Then you could store excess power and uh, uh, underground storage, hydro, many options. That's an expensive way, even though it is cheaper than the way we do power now. The cheapest way, and I think the most elegant way, is that you would have in orbit around Earth relay satellites. They would accept power from the moon and then send out multiple beams down to receivers on Earth. And these would be in high orbits, uh, such as are associated with the, uh, Soviet, uh, the Russian communication satellites called Molina orbits, high inclination orbits. So it's a dynamic system in which beams would shift back and forth from the moon to a satellite to the receiver where the power is needed. These are all microwave beams. And this would be microwave. It's proposed for the industrial microwave band around 2.4 uh, uh, gigahertz, about 10 centimeter wide, uh, long ways. Is there any danger associated with those beams if they were the to beam, hit? The beams have to be kept at low intensity so they would be safe. The way that these are normally modeled is the beams would have an intensity of about 20 percent of sunlight. Now those would go into industrially zoned areas. You would not want to walk around in them. You certainly could for periods of time, but that would not be good. Outside of that area though there would be very very much lower intensity than uh, beneath the uh, safety guidelines. Now I think with the things that have happened since the 1980s are that the it looks to like the receivers on earth can be much cheaper to build than were looked at in the early 80s. What that means is you can bring down the intensity of the beams below the levels that are now set by or observed by IEEE and other standard organizations for continuous exposure of the, in, of the general population. I don't think that's necessary to do. You're talking about an industrial operation and you would zone it that way. Mm -hmm. With your permission, sure. just answer the safety question. This has been uppermost in the minds of all people who have worked on this uh, concept. And uh, there is a lot of domestic microwave use, like 300 million ovens. And we have NASA, for example, has uh, taken the sort of uh, standard that at the maximum we are one quarter of sunlight and at the edge of the receiving antenna, we are about the same as if you stand four feet away from a microwave oven with the door closed. We have done experiments on birds flying through the beam. This was done for the Environmental Protection Agency. So there's 13,000 papers dealing with microwave safety because it is widely used in industry and the domestic uses, and there is a tremendous amount of information on all aspects, and we are committed in this kind of a scheme to use all of the international standards which have been developed, which all countries adhere to, or at least that's what they should do, to make sure that this is the safest energy production method. Thank the Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a couple of questions. First of all, uh, Dr. Criswell, the average American's consumption of energy is what about? Uh, the average for the U.S. is about 11 kilowatts of thermal energy per person. Of thermal energy. Yeah. So, if they were electric, if you measure that in electricity, how much electricity would they use? On the average? Depends on how you apply it, but as a rule of thumb, divide by a factor of three, you'd get three to four kilowatts. So the recommendation electric. is that we bring the rest of the world up to two or three, you'd be coming close to the American average. I, I've been in uh, China, an emerging mm -hmm. nation, and they you know, don't have enough electricity right. to do the things that they need to do, mm -hmm. uh, according to you know, uh, industrial nation. And uh, of course, you get into third world countries, and it's just not there, period. Uh, the average nuclear plant, what is a uh, 2,000 uh, kilowatt hours? Well, I, I tend to think of these things in gigawatts because uh, a gigawatts, billion, yeah. billion watts and a, a big nuclear installation, a collection of plants would be about a gigawatt. I think the typical plant is 
a half a gigawatt. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe mm -hmm. 500. The 500 megawatt. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if w if we start, to, you know, my state we have 12 nuclear plants. Two mm -hmm. of them are going out in my area. Two of them are going to be out of commission within a year. It looks like, and as we start to cycle down those. Uh, you can actually l deliver electricity in these low intensity beams. I mean, can you l can you deliver electricity in that type of numbers quantity? Yes. Yeah. You can supply the U.S. electric needs by using about five percent of the land area now associated with the generation of and transmission of electric power. That includes coal mines and railroad uh, lines Damn, that are so dedicated to hydro. it. Hydro. Yeah, uh, I had the pleasure over the last five years to work with a, an economist at the University of Houston, Russell Thompson. Unfortunately, he died of cancer in January. But one of the things I asked him to do was look at the proposition. Suppose the United States had stayed on the moon with a small permanent manned base after we finished Apollo. By 1980, that was a time that the studies of the solar power satellite systems were coming to a head. It was clear the technology was there to do that, but the cost were a problem. And so using the models that we've developed since then, we said, what would be the effect on the U.S. economy if we had instituted the lunar power program at that point in 1980 and built up to about three or 400 gigawatts of delivered power by the year 2000? And what would it have added? In his models, then, we could take the real economy, and then we could look at how the economy was affected by this change in energy basis, where the wholesale cost of the electricity came out to about three cents a kilowatt hour. What we found was that you would have added, by the year 2000, about 60 billion a year in direct economic benefit by this new source of energy. You would have had a multiplier of about a quarter, uh, about a factor of three. So you would have been adding, or about four. You would have been adding about a quarter of a trillion a year to the U.S. economy by now, not counting any add-on for export or sale of, of technology or export of energy. I, I don't want to get Buck Rogers type uh, scenario here, but if a country was able to develop this high energy or low intensity high energy beam from the, the moon and uh, then by satellite, uh, could that be used as a, a danger to other countries? Or, I mean, if you had a hostile country that did that, could they use that in a, in a negative way, Dr. Glaser? I'm delighted to tell you that this has been looked at already by NASA and Department of Energy. Eventually, this will have to be a under some international legal and regulatory framework just as we have communication satellites under international legal regulatory framework and I believe that there's enough evidence that would show if anybody would try and do something different first of all I believe that eventually just like in Intelsat there will be some international ownership Intelsat, I believe, is owned by 128 countries. I could visualize it. Eventually, sometimes in the next century, we would actually have an international energy supply system from the moon or from uh, orbit or whatever the best uh, approach will be. And I think that this is perhaps the best way that we can make sure that nobody can misuse the power. Uh, I know our focus has kind of switched here to solar electricity. But something that I have worked on in uh, my career in the legislature and also here is something that we need to find uh, society demands that we find clean energy. And this society and uh, future society will demand more and more energy and how we get it without b uh, burning fossil fuels or being able to how to find new places to store spent nuclear low, high uh, level energy is, is just an enigma around this place, how we get those things done. So it's interesting, and I'm going to end, uh, Dr. Uh, Burnins, and, uh, you're an educator, American University, uh, as well as an astronomer. What trigger do you need, do you see, you work with young people all the time, to get them excited, to get them involved, to get them committed to this type of endeavor for their future? I think they're ready to go. I think what they need is to know that the nation is ready. It strikes me that during the Apollo era, we had a focus, we had a purpose, we had a dream, we had a goal, we had a date certain, and we did it. 
<clears throat> and then we lost it. At the end of Apollo, how curious the history books of the future will be written. Can you imagine someone writing a history book 500 years from now? Back at that time in the United States, they decided to leave the Earth. They went to the moon. They took those first steps, and then they came back again, sort of like a child putting their foot in the cold water of the ocean and retreating, and they didn't return. Our space program began to seem to lose its focus. The Challenger disaster hit hard. The flaw in the Hubble certainly hurt. The end of the Cold War removed the competitiveness that we once had. What I urgently would plead, if I might summarize much of what I've heard in the last few hours, is that this committee continue on with your series of hearings, that perhaps you collaborate with some of the other committees and subcommittees that are interested in these matters as well, that there is a need, I believe, for a general education, dialogue, discussion involving members of Congress, NASA, and the American public generally. What is needed ultimately are long-term plans realistic, visionary, bold plans. I happen to have had the honor of serving on the Exploration Advisory Task Force to NASA headquarters. We were in place at the time that President Bush came to this very building to announce that we would return to the moon this time to stay and then go on to Mars. And he gave a date certain by the 50th anniversary of Apollo. It didn't come with funding, however. But it also gave me an opportunity at the request of NASA to come in and go through all of their files and everything that had been done about this. Do you know how many studies have been done? How many hearings have been held? The report of Dr. Webb, the Sally Ride report, the synthesis report, the files are filled with it. And how many of them have been implemented? Virtually none at all. The fact is that while we take enormous pride in the things around us, much of this is history. My concern is the history of the future. And in my testimony, I said it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when and who. And the fact is, our competitors are moving now. And I hope the United States can restate itself with young people uh, as the leader in the world. Well, thank you, Doctor. And I think that brings us to a fine conclusion. I appreciate your contribution today. It certainly has sparked our, our imagination in a different way, different from the first panel. But uh, certainly, that is the future. And we have to start to focus. And uh, you've made a great contribution. Uh, this uh, concludes our hearing for today. And the meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned.